Manitoba and the East. And also at 4 Eastern, the BC Lions take on the Edmonton Eskimos, Saskatchewan West. We'll see that Western semifinal. For all of us, Terry Leibel, Tom Harrington, and myself, Scott Russell, thanks for watching, and so long. The following is a live presentation of CBC Sports. Playoff football is back in Baltimore, and it shows. Today, the CFL ventures across the border for its first ever playoff game in the U.S. The road to the Grey Cup is winding down. Today, it runs through Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. An all-American CFL team riding a wave of success. Host one that wants to keep the cup where it has its roots, in Canada. The CFLers are an expansion team in name only. They play like an established franchise, steeped in talent, from offense to defense, deep at every position. The Argos continue their march back towards respectability, led by one of the CFL's major stars, the pinball, and a defensive master, Toronto's all-time pass thief. Two major league cities with a rivalry that now extends to football on semi-final Saturday. couple of stops left on the road to the Grey Cup and at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore today either the CFLers or the Argos will hit a dead end. The atmosphere here has been charged all season long and is especially so today for this playoff matchup with a rival city. They don't like the Blue Jays in Baltimore and the Argos are bound to feel the wrath of the CFL's loudest fans in this postseason game. Welcome now to Baltimore. I'm Scott Oak. There's a chill in the air, a natural grass surface for a game in which there are no sure bets, and 40,000 fans to watch it. Isn't this the way it's supposed to be? The Argos don't have playoff history on their side. East Division teams don't often win playoff games on the road, but the Argos won a regular season game in Baltimore back in August, so they likely had that on their mind when they arrived at Memorial Stadium about two hours ago led by rookie quarterback Marvin Graves, who sparked a second-half improvement in the Argos this season. Baltimore's starting quarterback has a decided edge in playoff experience. Tracy Ham has completely recovered from an arm injury suffered in Sacramento last week or so, we are told. But Ham has lost one of his major weapons. Mike Pringle is out of this game. There had been suggestions as late as this afternoon. Pringle would play, but a groin injury suffered uh, in practice this week has sidelined Pringle. The CFLers submitted their final roster an hour ago, and Pringle's name was not on it. The loss of the most uh, prolific running back in CFL single season history has changed the complexion of this game. So now can a rookie quarterback steal it for the Argos? Bob Obilovich doesn't think Marvin Graves is in over his head. Well, we'll soon know. Uh, we've got a lot of confidence in Marvin. He's, he's got a lot of composure for a young guy. He's been in a lot of big games. Uh, he played in three bowl games during his college career, winning one of them as a freshman quarterback and being the MVP. So... Uh, I hope he doesn't get too excited and the rest of our young players just uh, keep their poise and play hard and go out and execute our game plan because I think we're really well prepared for this football game. Yes, with three bowl games in a big-time American college football program, Marvin Graves obviously knows the feeling of big-time football. And so do Don Whitman and James Curry. They're in the broadcast booth in Baltimore today for this first-ever CFL playoff game in the U.S. Don? Thanks, Scott. Hi, everybody. James, I detected an air of confidence in the Argo dressing room today. I suppose that optimism is based on the victory here at Memorial Stadium three months ago. Well, this is a team that has gotten better as the season has gone on, and Toronto came in rightfully with a lot of confidence today. If Baltimore, the second-place finisher in the East, is going to win this game and advance to the Eastern Final, what are the keys to victory? Keys for Baltimore today is that without Mike Pringle, they need to control the Argonaut pass rush. They really don't have to concern themselves that much with the passing game this afternoon. And then on the other hand, Mike Clemens, they must limit his punt returns. The first game they played, he took one back all the way against the CFLers. And on the third hand, the drop of the Argo linebackers. If they can exploit that weak area that Toronto's had problems with this season, Baltimore can have a lot of success this afternoon and we get a perfect example of it right here in the drop Don Moan releases a receiver Chris Armstrong and he gets into the scene. 
Chris Armstrong was the leading receiver this year for Baltimore. He had 18 touchdown receptions, and he's going to be a key man in their passing attack, and Don Moan will have to try and defend against him. Well, a big, big job for Don Moan today. He's back in the lineup after missing several games, so will those legs be able to carry him for 60 minutes today? On the other side of the coin, for the Argos to win, what will they have to do? Argonauts, Mike Clemens needs to be more involved in offense. He needs to touch the ball about 20 times today, Don, for the Argonauts to have a lot of game success. Marvin Graves must show the composure that they've been expected of him and that he's been showing for the most part this season. And then when you look at Wayne Lamley, the kicking game they've had problems with all year long in the first game. He had a field goal block that possibly cost him the game. Lamley has been inconsistent, and he handles both the place kicking and the punting chores. They need a big game today from number 15. Really do. The specialty teams have been the biggest problem for the Argonauts all season long. They've had several punts blocked. Michael Clemens, though, is the big man on the specialty teams that can turn things around for the Argonauts today. Not only will Michael Clemens be a big man on special teams for the Argos, I think we'll see him line up in a slot back position. They're going to try and get the ball into his hands as often as possible this afternoon. The Argos think that will be a key to victory. Scott? Okay, Don, for CFL playoff games, we're used to layered clothing and sideline heaters, so we'll gladly take this weather. It got up to about 15 in Baltimore today. It's cooling off now, but it's comfortable, and the wind is negligible. As we head to kickoff here, so are the Eskimos and BC Lions at Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton. There's a panoramic view from the roof of Commonwealth, and we'll have up-to-the-minute highlights of that West Division semifinal as we go along today. On Live at the Half, the latest from Edmonton, and we'll go live to Winnipeg on the eve of the Bomber-Ottawa semifinal. We'll begin the proceedings here in Baltimore when we come back to kick off semifinal Saturday. Not only is this the first time that a CFL playoff game has taken place on American soil, but it's the first time in CFL history that coaches with over 100 wins have faced each other. Bob Obilovich, 115 career wins. That includes playoff activity. Don Matthews, 108 career victories. Obilovich, number five in the all-time list. Don Matthews is number six. The ceremonial coin toss this afternoon was performed by a former Baltimore great, Johnny Unitas, and a tremendous round of applause for Johnny Unitas, who led the Colts to three NFL championships as he left the field here at Memorial Stadium, a field where he starred for a number of years before the team picked up and moved to Indianapolis in the middle of the night in 1984. Donald Igwe BK preparing to kick off for the Baltimore CFLers. Gordon and Modine are back, and Mohammed Shamsuddin flips it out on a reverse to Thomas. Thomas got away from the first man, but he can't escape the second, Alvin Walton, who makes the tackle back at the 20-yard line. The Toronto Argonauts attempting a reverse on the opening kickoff, but it didn't work as they had planned. And now coming into the ball game, the man who must have a good game this afternoon for the Argos to be successful, rookie quarterback Marvin Graves out of Syracuse. 11 touchdown passes this year, nine interceptions. He has not faced Baltimore. He was not the quarterback in the two previous games. Mike Kerrigan played the first, and Reggie Slack the second. Mohamed Shamsit Dean on the first carry of the ball game slipped, and Gerald Bayless, the outstanding CFL defensive player a year ago, made the tackle. Well, Marvin Graves is very important for him. Now he's forced into his first passing situation of the game, and he has to sit back and not be pressured here. The offensive line has to give him time. Tom, Rob Creefo has been one of his key targets because he's a big receiver, and Marvin likes to look for him. Four receivers line up wide to the right. The pinball goes to the left. Graves looks that direction, throws over the middle to Masadi. Paul Masadi in a foot race to the end zone, decides to cut back and is cut from behind by Irvin Smith. Big play early for Marvin Graves, a 62-yard strike to the leading receiver on the year for the Argos, Paul Masada. Talked about the poison open of a Marvin Graves, and we saw it evident on the first play of the game. Watch the protection by his offensive line. They're giving him plenty of time, to, and Masada was his primary receiver as he got inside of Irvin Smith on that post route, and he was off to the races. Very big second down play for the Argos as Masadi takes it 62 yards to the 31, first and 10 Toronto. Again, the same formation, four receivers wide to the right. Graves slipped as he tried to set up, and it came in and out of the arms of rookie Dave Irwin. 
Irwin out of the University of Guelph did not get a starting assignment until the final game of the year last weekend in Winnipeg. That time it seemed like Marvin might have pushed because he lost his footing. And when young quarterbacks do that a lot, they'll get a sense of urgency about him. And that time he put too much mustard on that ball to Irwin. And it went off his hands, a very catchable ball, but maybe too much steam. In what appears to be an obvious passing situation, an extra defensive back. Lester Smith comes in, Alvin Walton goes out for Baltimore. Five receivers this time lined up wide right. Graves flushed out of the pocket. Graves is in trouble. Good move to get away. And now Graves slips as he tries to make a cut. And the Argo players are having some of the same problems that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers experienced on this field two weeks ago when they were hammered 57-10. One of the tough situations moving from the artificial surface to the natural surface, as you have here at Memorial Stadium, is the footing that players are not accustomed to. You see Graves as he rolls out. Should have pulled up inside of uh, Peyton, but he decided to go to the sideline. Watch as he plants on his heels, and that's the reason why he loses his footing. You have to put the front of those feet down to assure that you won't slip. Dan Webb, the equipment man, was experimenting with a variety of cleats in the pregame warm-up, and they've been making some adjustments. Wayne Lamley comes into the ball game, a 38-yard field goal attempt. It's up, and it's good, and the Argos are first on the board with 12-12 remaining in the opening quarter here at Memorial Stadium. Confidence of Wayne Lamley that may have been shaken at times earlier this year was undoubtedly given a boost with his first field goal attempt in this semifinal playoff game of 38 yards being successful. And now Lamley prepares to kick off. Smith and Drummond are back, and Smith will handle it at the 15-yard line. They take the reverse, and Smith brings it out to the 38. They make, uh, fake the reverse with Sheldon Hanley. And Leon Hassiano was there to make the tackle after a 23-yard return. This is the second most successful season that Tracy Ham has had in the CFL. His previous busiest year was 1990 with Edmonton when he threw the ball 559 times and completed 285. And 36 of those went for touchdowns. This year, 30 of his passes have gone for touchdowns. But most importantly, he has only been intercepted 13 times. Drummond, the ball carrier, his first ever carry for Baltimore. He's in the ball game, replacing Mike Pringle. As Scott said at the opening, there was speculation up until about an hour before game time as to whether or not Pringle would dress. But Drummond is in the running back position, and that was his first ever CFL carry. We get a look at Drummond there in the offensive lineup. And he's been a pass receiver in his play with the Baltimore CFL team thus far this season. So that first carry was critical, Don, that he pick up some good yardage. Drummond is the receiver, and this is what he does so well. He has good hands, perhaps better hands, than the man he has replaced, Mike Pringle. Calvin Tiggle and Keith Costello make the tackle. That's a 12-yard gain. Baltimore early is going to go to this hurry-up offense, try to keep Toronto off balance defensively, and this is what Tracy Ham can do very well. Something else that Drummond does well is throw the football. And in their repertoire, they may have a toss and a throwback involving Drummond. Ham escapes the initial pressure. Well over the head of Sean Beals, the man he was looking for, who was being covered by Namako at the 35-yard line. Tracy Ham took a bump on his elbow last week against Sacramento. He said it was a hit on the funny bone and really nothing serious. The Argos have improved their defensive play over the past few weeks. One of the reasons, number 95, big Jeff Fields, most often, it requires two people to handle him, and that frees up Rodney Harding, who had his best every year in quarterback sack. Tremendous downfield protection. The pass dumped off, and an ineligible receiver is the man it went to, John Earl. 
had the ball land in his hands, but Tracy Ham is complaining that the pass was deflected towards Earl. The ball was deflected by Swift Birch, and that's one of the things we spoke about in the opening is the pass rush of the Argonauts. Without that consistent ground gainer in the backfield for Baltimore is that the Argonauts will pin back their ears and come after you. See him flushed out of the pocket. Swift Birch keeping contain on Tracy Ham, batting down the ball. Swift Birch came over in a trade in the preseason from the Baltimore CFLers to the Toronto Argonauts. A former MVP at Temple in his senior year. Nine quarterback sacks for the Argos this year, and his play over the last few weeks has improved tremendously. Well, it's really helped that front four. When you look at Fowler, Fields, Harding, and Birch, they've developed into a solid front four, and that is the key. If you're going to win a championship, you have to have some big guys up front that can put pressure on the opposing quarterback. Josh Miller, the punter, led the CFL in average 42.9 yards per kick. Mike Pinball Clemens is the lone man back for the Argos. In the first meeting of the season between these two teams, Clemens had two punt return touchdowns. One of them was called back because of a penalty. Good downfield coverage by Baltimore as they stop his progress at the 26-yard line. Ken Benson was the first man downfield after a 36-yard kick. Well, the Argonauts with their second offensive possession of the first quarter. We saw early that they hit Paul Mazzotti with the big play on second and ten. He got behind Irvin Smith on a post route. Big play to put the Argonauts in great field position, and, and the result was a re Wayne Lamley field goal. Now can Marvin Gray successfully execute a second drive of the game? The Acadia product had a record year in the CFL. Only the second Argo receiver, Canadian receiver, with 1,000 yards. Dave Irwin was tackled immediately by Carl Anthony. And Irwin is uh, still down. I was going to say he's very slow in getting up, but he has not yet got up. This would be a blow for the Argos. The Argonauts came into this game thin at wide receiver. Norm Casola is the only backup receiver on the roster, a rookie in his own right, and if they lose Irwin early in the game, now they're going to have to juggle the roster, and that's one of the problems for the Canadian team. Well, Bob Obilovich at one point this season was hoping to go with three Canadians at the receiving position. He had Tommy Kane, and he had Jeff Fairholm to complement Paul Masati, and they had Dave Irwin as a backup. Fairholm was injured, Kane was injured, and then Kane was released by the Argos when they thought that Fairholm was ready to come back after rehabilitation. He injured the knee again. Well, you get a shot of it right there. Looked like Anthony got that helmet right in the left rib cage of Irwin as he came down with that reception. Marvin Graves put the ball right on the money, but didn't seem like much of a hit, but you know, you get a helmet right there in that area, and it can cause problems at that time, and Irwin is still down. Now the big adjustment for Coach Obilovich. Early in the game, he's forced to play his hand. He has to start with his roster adjustment. You know, when you talk about injuries, it's been a very good year for Baltimore. They have not had many injuries, but they have lost a couple of key players going into this postseason game. Keith Ballard, Mike Pringle, and Matt Goodwin are all out. Will come in at a running back position. They want to get Clemens into the ball game. This time, Lester Smith slips as he tries to field it. And there's a penalty flag. This flag flies as Toronto players were attempting to vacate the five-yard area. Norm Casola was downfield to make the tackle. A 42-yard punt that time by Wayne Lamley and Lester Smith, after he recovered, got four yards on the return. But the Baltimore field position will be improved by a no-yards call against Toronto. 17, five-yard penalty. First down. Eddie Thomas was the player that was flagged for that no yards. Interesting story in Lester Smith. For the first time in many years, that someone other than Gizmo Williams or Earl Winfield led the CFL in punt returns, and Lester Smith was the player in his rookie season with the Baltimore CFLers. He led the CFL in punt return yardage, 11.6 per return. Movement at the line of scrimmage prior to the ball being snapped, and Robert Drummond, the ball carrier, picks up about a yard before being stopped by Calvin Tiggle. 
Steve Barato, one of the assistant coaches for Baltimore, was telling me before the game that one of the reasons Toronto has had some success against Baltimore this year is that they play a defensive style similar to Sacramento. They don't really come after you a whole bunch. They try and take away some of the field from you. Basically what it's called is catch and read as you let the offensive linemen start their initial movement and then you just read where they're going and all it is is gap cancellation and the defensive linemen have done a great job of it this season for the Argonauts because Calvin Teagle coming into this game had 121 solo tackles from his middle linebacker position. Rodney Harding was charged with the offside. Drummond, the ball carrier, should have a first down as he goes across the 50, and Carlos Fowler was there to make the tackle. 7.37 is the time remaining in the opening quarter with Toronto leading Baltimore by a score of 3 nothing. A late developing play inside counter, allowing the pursuit of the Argonauts to overrun the play. Drummond came behind it, picked up the five and the first down. Hurry up offense for Baltimore once again. Drummond, like Graves, a product of Syracuse, he was leaving Syracuse when Gra Graves was arriving. And throws over the middle, and the catch is made by an ex-Argo, Robert Clark, close to a first down. This is one of the situations that we looked at in our opening. The linebackers of the Argonauts, how effective would they be in the pass drop? Don Moan that time got in a mismatch that Tracy Ham loved to exploit. A slot back on a linebacker. He came cut underneath Don Moan. Don Moan had to close and make the stop, but only after the first down. First and 10, Baltimore at the 38 of Toronto. Three receivers wide to the left as Ham is in the shotgun. Ham looks deep and he overthrows Robert Clark. Mm -hmm. Clark last year was with the Toronto Argonauts. As a matter of fact, he had 50 catches for 900 receptions last year and uh, three touchdowns. He was at the Atlanta Falcon training camp this year and joined Baltimore two games into the season. Well, he came to Toronto, to Toronto last year on the word of uh, assistant coach Mouse Davis, who went to Atlanta this year, took Clark as a free agent, didn't stick. Baltimore is very happy to have him. Second and ten, Tracy Ham again operating from the shotgun with three receivers left. Armstrong makes the catch down at the ten-yard line. What a season Chris Armstrong is having. 28 yards on the pass from Tracy Ham, who initially recommended to the... Baltimore CFLers and Coach Don Matthews that they give this man a chance. Well, the Argonauts came with an all-out blitz. Keith Respina came on a halfback blitz that meant that nobody was on the inside. Ham recognized it. Thomas one-on-one -on -one with Armstrong. He can't cover him with no support. Tracy Ham was a little concerned coming into this game that some of his audibles at the line of scrimmage might be picked up by the Argos who wanted to operate out of a huddle a little, little more. The pass at the goal line was knocked away by Tommy Henry intended for Walter Wilson. It will be second and ten. The ball just inside the ten yard line. The Argos become a little more aggressive defensively from the 30 yard line in. Well that's what you have to do on the play prior to this. We saw the blitz. This time the great play break on the ball by Henry his stepping in front of Clark right before the ball got to make that Walter Wilson. And checking off out of the shotgun. He looks to the corner intended for Drummond incomplete. Drummond got bumped by Don Moon as he was trying to get back into his pattern. He looked briefly to the official and is still complaining to the official about the lack of a flag. But it is third and goal for Baltimore as Tracy Ham is unable to connect with number two. Well, it's tough for Don Moan to run stride for stride with Robert Drummond right here. As you see the two players get tangled up, Don Moan had an arm wrapped around Drummond as he was trying to get the separation and the flag didn't come. Baltimore might have had a complaint on the play. An unhappy Drummond heads to the sidelines and a relieved Don Moon remains on the field as Baltimore sends out its field goal unit, Donald Igwe Bike, who has hit on 16 of his last 17 attempts. 
ties this game at three. A 17-yarder with 4.49 remaining in the opening quarter. And Baltimore and Toronto are deadlocked at three. Quarter here at Memorial Stadium. The Argos and uh, the CFL are tied at three. You can see Marvin Graves trying to stay limber on the sidelines. There's some concern over stiffness in his lower back. It's a problem he's had all season long, so he's, as I say, trying to stay limber. There was also some concern over footwear, and early in this game, both Marvin Graves and Mo Dean changed their cleats from the small size to the larger one uh, in order to get better uh, grip on the field. Uh, obviously, the Argos came prepared, Don. Yes, the Argos were experimenting with a variety of cleat sizes. And Dan Webb was explaining to me that it's critical as to the placement of the cleats. You place them in a triangle formation on the front of the cleat. But you don't want those long uh, cleats on the back of the shoe. Mohamed Shamsuddin on the kickoff return for Toronto, and he's bowled over by Alvin Walton, who has been a key figure this year for Baltimore on special teams. A 15-yard return for Muhammad Shamsuddin. He made his debut on October 2nd against the Hamilton Ticats in that memorable come-from-behind victory. He ran for 165 yards in that game. You get a good shot here of Walton coming in, putting that shoulder. Walton has that reputation of a tenacious hitter. He was on two Super Bowl teams with the Washington Redskins while he was in the NFL, and he's been a great plus for this Baltimore team. Dave Irwin back in the lineup for Toronto. Good inside fake by Graves. Now he pumps downfield, being chased by Bayless. Lobs it down the sidelines intended for Clemens. Clemens wouldn't have been able to make the catch as he would have been out of bounds. Marvin Graves is a quarterback that doesn't care to run that often. They know that he has the ability, but the biggest plus that he has developed is that he will stay in the pocket and allow his receivers to come open downfield. That time the ball got away from him, went out of bounds. You'll see O.J. Brigance here trying to keep contain on Marvin Graves. Pierre Vercheval had a fine season this year for the Argonauts after coming back after a knee injury. is a big plus in their offensive line. Again, six defensive backs for Baltimore. They show blitz, and here they come. And Graves throws for Crepo, and Crepo makes the catch at the 50-yard line, but he's two yards shy of a first down. He made the catch in front of Ken Watson. Crepo, the big target, six foot six. Marvin Graves feels very comfortable in throwing the ball to Rob Crepo. When he's in trouble, he will normally look that direction because he's an easy man to find in front of Tracy Gravely. Crepo missed the final two games of the season after he, like Mohamed Shamsuddin, made his Argo debut on the 2nd of October against Hamilton. Pressure was coming up the middle, but Lamley got the kick away, fielded by Smith, and he brings it back to the 35-yard line. That's a 34-yard kick and a five-yard run back. The center, Blaine Schmidt, was the first downfield to make the tackle. Number 36, Lester Smith, one of four players to have his uniform retired at the Citadel. Well, an excellent athlete. He's been primarily the nickelback this year for the Baltimore secondary. As I mentioned earlier, the CFL top punt returner, but Robert Pressbury came very close to that Wayne Lamley punt. And Wayne Lamley has had several kicks blocked this season, and Baltimore has blocked one in the first game of the season. And so specialty teams has been a problem for the Argonauts all season long. And Toronto fans have made the track to Baltimore to take in this semifinal playoff encounter that is tied at three. There's the quick toss to Tui Peloto, and he has a first down as he takes the ball up to the 48 for a gain of 13. Rodney Harding and Swift Birch combined to bring down Tui Pelotu, who was the second leading pass receiver this year for Baltimore, running out of the fullback position. Well, Tracy Ham has done a fine job this season of utilizing his running backs. Baltimore led the CFL in yard reception by the running backs, 1,285 yards on the season. So it gave them that extra addition of different receivers to utilize other than just the four wideouts. Well, they line up Tui Peloto at a variety of positions. This time he's at wide out as the handoff goes to Robert Drummond, and Drummond picks up about three yards, stopped by Swift Birch with 2.30 remaining in the opening quarter at Memorial Stadium. Well, Calvin Teagle, they try to protect their middle linebacker, and you get a good shot of Teagle as he reads Nick Subas, the center. He comes back underneath to help Swift Swift Birch out on the tackle. The Argonaut defensive front seven has played very well here in the first quarter. And what a year Calvin Tiggle has had as a rookie in the CFL. Three receivers to the left. That's the direction that Ham Luck throws to Walter Wilson, and he is cut down on a 
Good tackle by Calvin Tingle. A very aggressive Argonaut defense here in the first quarter. Excellent pursuit of getting out on that slip screen. They recognized it early. Tegel, along with Jeff Fields, able to get underneath. As you see the flow going towards the ball here, Tegel gets that arm out along with Fields, and they knock off Clark after the reception. July 7th, when these two teams met, Baltimore won 28-20 in the return match in Baltimore on August the 20th. It was 31-24 for the Argos. Don, you know when you look at Calvin Tegel, I mean, this young man coming in leading the CFL in tackles in his rookie year was just a fine accomplishment by him. Didn't get the nod for Eastern Outstanding Defensive Player, but very deserving of any other accolades he may receive. First contact by Lester Smith. The pinball had taken the ball in full flight and was looking to get to the outside, but Lester Smith who not only returns punts for Baltimore, but also excels in special team coverage, got down there to prevent the pinball from getting to the outside. Well, one of the things with Clemens playing on this natural surface, he is one of those turf-type runners, and he doesn't have the great footing here like most other players this afternoon, but Baltimore with their special team coverage getting down, corralling Clemens, limiting the lanes that he has to run in, has done a great job here. Bobby Gordon is the man in motion across the formation. Inside handoff with the pinball, and the pinball is met by Matt Goodwin and driven back. Matt's twin brother, Malcolm, is not in the lineup. He got hurt in the final game of the season against Sacramento. And in tribute to him, Matt has his twins' numbers, number 55, penciled on the inside of his arm. Well, these two brothers have spent their entire career, high school, college, and now professional together. When you look at Mike Clemens, had his only 100-yard rushing game as a professional here at Memorial Stadium on August 20th versus the Baltimore CFL. Doss again goes to Clemens, and Clemens looking for a first down is going to be close, depending on the spot. Gerald Bayless came over to make the tackle. 24 seconds, the time remaining in the first quarter at Memorial Stadium. Dave Ewell decides it's close enough for a measurement. Well, Toronto felt that it was very important, Don, coming into this game today that they could develop a running game and keep it established because they wanted to take some of the pressure off of quarterback Marvin Graves. And in the two games that these two teams played this season, Toronto gained 200, make that 304 yards on the ground, 34 yards on the ground in the two games. It is a first down, signals referee Dave Ewell. One of the reasons that Baltimore has had success in this first year in the Canadian Football League, an experienced CFL coaching staff with some experienced defensive players. As a matter of fact, Don Matthews acquired four who were nominees last year as the best defensive players on their teams elsewhere in the CFL. The winner of the CFL award was Gerald Bayless, and Alfred Payton was a runner-up. And with Ken Benson and O.J. Brigance, they have given Baltimore a tremendous defensive unit. Bobby Gordon with his first catch of the ball game. Can Gordon make it? No. He's corralled by Brooks down at the 12-yard line. And that should be the final play of the opening quarter. But what a play to end the opening quarter. Graves combining with Brooks for 49 yards. And to start the second quarter, the Argos are in scoring position. Experience the Esso Tiger. Spirit of service. For self-serve, you have a quick reset, and when a customer comes in, they can just start pumping right away. The little details, like making sure everything is stocked, making sure the drinks are cold, and making sure you always have good eye contact. It's the little things that make us special. suppliers and their employees earn over five billion dollars 
and we exported over $9 billion worth of products built here. To you, they're just components of your new car. But the sum of these parts is the livelihood of over 90,000 Canadians. At Chrysler, we're not just building cars, we're building Canada. The CFL on CBC. Brought to you by Dodge Trucks. Reinventing the truck. Beginning the second quarter in Baltimore, the Argos and Baltimore on even terms, but the Argos are driving after a big gain by Bobby Gordon. Here's the first report we have from Edmonton and the Lions and Eskimo semifinal, a 34-yard touchdown run by Sean Millington sent the BC Lions in front of the Eskimos this 12 minutes into the game. Made it 7-2 BC over Edmonton. The Esks had scored a pair of singles early in the contest, but then a 40-yard field goal by Sean Fleming it's made it 7-5. So the Eskimos now within two of the lines, but the Grey Cup champions are trailing, Don. Yes, and here at Memorial Stadium, the Toronto Argonauts tied with Baltimore at three. Start the second quarter, first and 10 from the 17 of Baltimore. Hand off to Mohamed Shamsud Dean. Big hole. He struggles down to the two. It will be first and goal for Toronto. A 16-yard run for Mohamed Shamsud Dean. The man beside him, Big Chris Schultz, was telling me prior to the game he thought they could run against Baltimore. Well, what they wanted to do was spread out the Baltimore defense, so they came with a five-receiver set. They got the linebackers out of the middle. The safety Brooks was gone. Shamsud Dean did a great job. He let the blocking develop in front of him cut back against the grain and he's at the two yard line first and goal Mohammed Shamsid Dean trying to get in and he does touchdown Toronto well the concern in the camp of the Baltimore CFL is about the Toronto Argonauts coming into the stadium I think is justified they felt that this Toronto team had showing over the final few weeks of the season that they were capable of playing with anybody and Mohamed Shamsid Dean has certainly added to their ground game. Well, the Argonauts proved earlier in the season that they could run on this Baltimore defense having accumulated 334 yards in the two previous games running against them and on the past two plays you saw an example of it. Wayne Lamely adds the point after as the Argos lead it by a score of 10-3. This is one of the things that Baltimore didn't want to occur. They were 6-3 and three at home this season versus opponents. Argonauts were one of the teams that handed them one of those three losses. And right here, getting up early, you know, you, you look at it. When you take the crowd out of this game, that's one of the problems that Baltimore faces in their first CFL playoff game. Well, they do have talented people up front defensively, Baltimore does, but they don't have a great deal of size and the old lineman for Toronto felt they could handle the speed of the people such as Alfred Payton and O.J. Brigham. And when you speak about the size Don, Joe Burgos and Chris Schultz are basically playing against two linebackers and when you put those big guys, Chris Schultz about 290 pounds, Burgos about 285 on two 225 pound linebackers they're going to win that match every time. And Chris Schultz, you saw him the past two plays, he ran behind a big left offensive the tackle and ended up with a touchdown by Sean Sadeen. Schultz was saying that Alfred Payton is an outstanding pass rusher. He said he uses his hands very well. He said, but he comes hard all the time, and if we can move him to the outside, we could open up some gaps up the middle, and that is what happened on the run by Sean Sadeen. Here's the fake by Lester Smith to Drummond. Lester Smith stays on his feet up to the 46-yard line. And that's where the Baltimore CFLers will scrimmage first and 10 after a 21-yard return. You know, in a game of this magnitude, I, I don't think that you're going to fool many players. Coach Obilovich has done a fine job with the discipline of the Argonauts this season. This is a team that has matured as the season has gone on. And you saw it evident on the first two returns by Baltimore when they fake the reverse. You had players stay at home, lane control on kick coverage and that time they made another stop in the open field. Wilson lines up wide to the left. Three receivers, Beals, Armstrong, and Clark. First and ten, move right. Hand off to Drummond, and Drummond 
Picks up about three yards before he is driven back. Shamsid Dean obviously did not play in the first two games against Baltimore. He did not join the Argos until October the 2nd, but he capped the 78-yard uh, drive, the big play, the final play of the first quarter, a 49-yard pass to Bob Gordon that set up the two runs by Shamsid Dean that put it in the end zone. Second and seven, Baltimore. Ham is under pressure. Throws over the middle, it's intercepted on a deflection, picked off by Keith Costello. Crazy hand pass picked off by Keith Costello. Uh, that's evidence of the legs of the young linebackers that the Argonauts have been employing here this season. Keith Costello got a starting job earlier in the season when Don Moan went out with a fluke injury where he got a nail stuck in his thigh out mowing his lawn, and Keith Costello came in and got that linebacker position and has held on to it ever since. Moan has had to move to the other side, but Moan gets the deflection on this play. You'll see Don Moan lay out, deflects the ball in the air. Keith Costello keeps running, comes up with the big interception. Costello gives the Argos a first down at the 53. Graves rolls to his right. Graves throws over the middle. It's incomplete, and that one almost deflected from Rob Crepo into the arms of a defender as a defender as Tracy Gravely had dropped that. Talking with Keith Costello prior to the game, he said, this one is ours. We're going to take this one. They can't play with us. They don't intimidate us. And that's the confidence that Coach Obilovich has been able to instill in the two teams. The only time these two coaches have ever met in the playoffs were in the 1983 Grey Cup at BC Place when Bob Obilovich came out on top in that game, 18-17. to 17. And ironically, the quarterback coach now for Baltimore is Joe Barnes, the quarterback who threw the winning touchdown pass. Well, Obilovich, even though his team had some ups and downs during the course of the season, was confident coming in here, felt his squad had a good game plan and was prepared for Baltimore, and they are certainly off to a good start, leading by a score of 10-3. Don, if you look at last week's game when they played Winnipeg, he pulled his starting quarterback Marvin Graves at halftime because he felt that he needed to get the entire team involved in the game. And we've seen evidence at the start of this game where B Gerald Bayless has gone down. He had a tick last week in Sacramento. They lost Mike Pringle. He pulled the groin last week in that quagmire down in Sacramento. So when you get a, a, a playoff position sewed up, Coach Obilovich's experience came through because he saved his players from being injured. Scott Miller replaces Gerald Bayless. Second and 10 Toronto. Graves is in the shotgun. Graves throws deep to the sidelines. Masadi can't make the catch. He had Carl Anthony all over him. You know, the pass, the last two passes that Marvin Graves has thrown have been right on the money. Rob Prefro dropped that hook over the middle where Goodwin came in front of him. He lost concentration. But Mazzotti and Anthony one-on-one -on -one up the right side. Mazzotti did a great job of disguising, turned around to the last moment, went after the ball fell through his arm. On the third down punt, the ball was blocked by Matt Goodwin coming up the middle. It was picked up by Joe Sardo. Matt Goodwin this year has blocked three opposition punts three times. He has returned them for touchdowns. He got through to partially block that kick by Wayne Lamley. And that comes with 11.48 remaining in the first half. The punt only traveled seven yards. We took the most comfortable full-size pickup on the road and made it more comfortable. We took the most thoughtful interior on the market and made it more thoughtful. We took the biggest cab in the industry and made it bigger. The new Dodge Ram Club Cab. First, we changed the rules, then we stretched them. From Dodge, Canada's truck stop. There's nothing can spoil a holiday more than a medical emergency or unexpected illness. Whether you're a snowbird like me or just on a weekend getaway, the CAA Away From Home Travel Insurance goes far beyond the limits of provincial plans. You're protected from soaring emergency medical and travel costs 24 hours a day, worldwide. So do like I do, and get the away from home card from your local CAA. 
I'm Harvey Kirk. If you're considering the purchase of new doors or windows, listen to what satisfied Buchanan customers say. S.W. Carter of Kingsville. I recently had Buchanan windows installed, and from the time I placed the initial call to your office to the completion of the job, there wasn't a hassle or a hitch. I'm very satisfied with the product, the price, and the installation. Mr. and Mrs. T. Huber of Wallaceburg. The installers were very fast, courteous, and considerate. The entire process from sale to installation has been a pleasant one for us. Buchanan, a sign of the times. The kicking game has been a problem this year for the Argos. Lamley had one blocked last week against Winnipeg, and he has this one blocked by Matt Goodwin, the fourth of the year for the Rookie of the Year candidate. And Goodwin came clean right up the middle. Goodwin also blocked the punt in the initial game of the year between the two teams. Came into this game, like you said, with three. That's his fourth on the year. They came in as a team with a league-high seven block punts on the season. Four of those have been returned for touchdowns. So following the interception, the Baltimore defense holds and with the block punt and the 15-yard penalty applied for no yards, Baltimore takes over first and 10 at the Toronto 43. Four receivers this time line up wide right. Tracy Ham is flushed out, moves to his left, throws the pass incomplete in and out of the hands of Tui Pelotu. Tui Pelotu was the lone receiver to line up left. The others were all off to the right. Don, one of the problems that Wayne Lamley has as a kicker is that he takes too long to put the ball in flight. He takes three strides getting the ball off, and that's what's plaguing him. That's what allowed teams to get to him, as we saw with Baltimore, in blocking that last kick. Second and ten. Lamley looks on as... Tracy Hand barks out the signal, calling an audible in the shotgun formation. He looks over the middle. It's incomplete. This draws a penalty flag. It was Don Moan defending against Tui Pelotu. Don Moan has been close in a couple of situations already tonight. We saw earlier as he was covering Drummond, and it was a questionable non-call in this situation. Now Tui Pelotu a matchup that they want to have Baltimore is getting a running back on Don Moan knowing that the running back should win that because he's younger. Toronto 36 delivered foul first out. The veteran of the Argo defensive unit the most experienced playoff performer for the Argos and with the penalty Baltimore has a first down at the 33 of Toronto. When you look at the alignment of the Argonaut linebackers, they're playing five to six yards off the ball of scrimmage. They're not respecting the Baltimore running game at all. John Beals makes the catch, and Calvin Tiggle takes Beals down short of a first down. Beals is slow in getting to his feet after the hit by Tiggle. Well, that horse can hit you. Calvin <laughs> Tiggle will be bringing the hammer. I will tell you, that time Sean Beals felt all of it. Calvin Tiggle, the mobility that he possesses, watch as he closes on Beals right here. He goes a little low, lays a nice solid lick on him right there as he tries to hurdle him, but Beals is up and still in the game. Tracy Ham has certainly spread the ball around so far in this semifinal game. He's used six different receivers. He's completed 50% of his passes. Six for 12 is Ham. Flushed out by Swift Birch. Dumps it off for Drummond. And then Drummond is dropped, but not before he gets a first down. Calvin Tickle and Keith Costello come across to make the tackle. Well, Something that the coach of the CFLers, Don Matthews, said is that Drummond not only is a good runner, but he's an excellent pass receiver. Well, Ham, as he ran out of time, Swift Birch got caught up with Neil Fort, the big 330-pound offensive tackle, allowing Tracy Ham to get outside, break and chain. At that point, Drummond recognized that his quarterback was in trouble, went to the open spot in the secondary. First down was the result. This time they flip-flop. Tui Pelotu comes to the short side of the field. Three receivers wide left. A handoff to Drummond. And Drummond with a big hole and another Baltimore first down. One of the things that the Argonauts had been doing was laying very deep with their linebackers. And you'll see evidence of it right here as Rock 
Robert Drummond hits the line of scrimmage. He has no one other until he hits the secondary, and Keenan Christina comes up. The linebackers, when you're playing off six to seven yards on the running plays, there's a lot of running room, and if he can find a seam, as you saw, a 12-yard run as a result. Five carries for 31 yards so far for Drummond. He gets the call again, and he battles his way down to the one-yard line. Baltimore in the two previous games against the Argos did not have success in running the football. They had 62 yards the first time they met, and in the second game, Baltimore had 46 yards. Well, you're good. A good look at Drummond coming right down the pike here. Getting out, Earl has a, did a good job on the middle linebacker, Teagle, and that is the key. If you can get a hat on Teagle to slow down his pursuit, you can pick up some yardage, and that time Baltimore was able to get to the one. It will be second and goal from the one. Han is calling for quiet as he barks out the signals. The short yardage offense is out there for Baltimore. Hand off to Drummond. Up he goes, and in he goes for the major score. seem at all concerned about moving Drummond into the backfield replacing Mike Pringle. Of course he would have preferred to have Pringle in the lineup because he established the league record this year for rushing but he felt that Drummond was a most capable replacement and so far he's proven the coach correct this afternoon. Coming into the game he was completely healthy. He hadn't had one carry on the ground all season long and he shows that ability to explode once he hit the hole. Pringle you knew that he could break tackles but Drummond may have more flat out speed. And Drummond was a sprinter in college. And he does have speed and is a better pass catcher than Mike Pringle. Pringle is a little more powerful a running back than number two, Robert Drummond. But well, Drummond showed some power and some athletic ability in going up and over. He went up over the top, and it was number two on number two, Reggie Pleasant. Reggie Pleasant is not going to win that battle against Robert Drummond. Robert Drummond goes about 215 pounds, but the surge of the offensive line, reestablishing the line of scrimmage. You see a lot of white jerseys back in the end zone and laying on the ground. And when you can do that, Baltimore did a great job of getting off the ball. They will get into the end zone when you're on the one-yard line. Reggie Pleasant tried to knock the ball out of the hands of Robert Drummond with the hit at the goal line, but Drummond had both arms wrapped around the football. And with the point after by Donald Igwe BK, Don Matthews, Baltimore CFLers, are deadlocked at 10 with the Toronto Argonauts. You know, when you look at the overall scheme of things in the first two meetings of these teams, Toronto out yardage-wise on Baltimore, they out had more yardage, 971 to, to would make it 791 to 740, so this team can play against Baltimore offensively. Penalty flag on the kickoff return by Robert Gordon. We'll sort it out when we return. Back to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore where the Argos and the CFLers are now on even terms after Robert Drummond finished off a Baltimore touchdown drive with his vault. Uh, seven plays, 43 yards, and Baltimore kept the ball for almost four minutes in Edmonton. The Eskimos have taken the lead over the BC Lions. This is 60-yard pass and run play from Damon Allen to downtown Eddie Brown. Brown had a 1,000-yard receiving season and 12 touchdowns. Now a big one in the playoffs, and at last word, the Eskimos had the Lions 12-7 in their West semifinal, Don. And Muhammad Shamsuddin is the ball carrier for Toronto, picking up about eight yards on the kickoff return. A holding call had taken the Argos back towards their own goal line, and Muhammad Shamsuddin brings it out to the 35. It will be second and three. You know, you look at that touchdown that Drummond scored on that last series for the Colts, well, the CFL, excuse me. That was the first professional rushing touchdown that he scored since 1990. And he may have injured his hand in the process as Mohammed Shamsuddin is the ball carrier again, searching for a first down. He had to get up to about the 38-yard line. Well, they had been working on his hand on the sideline, his left hand, so 
he may have. Let's go down to the sideline to Scott. All right, James. Well, uh, we want to take a complete look now at the touchdown that has given the Eskimos the lead over the BC Lions at Commonwealth Stadium in the second quarter of their West semifinal. Here it is. Damon Allen over the middle to number four, downtown Eddie Brown, and uh, nothing between him now in the end zone except turf, and he took it in to give the Eskimos a 12-7 lead, 60-yard play. And here at Memorial Stadium, the game is tied at 10 with 6.49 remaining in the second quarter. The Argos were looking at third and about a yard, and the Argos caught Baltimore moving prematurely and the offside penalty will give Toronto a first down. Joe Washington got caught that neutral zone. You know, so many times teams will use that shift of voice inflection calls and that time as Joe Washington got caught in the neutral zone, they snapped the ball right away. Hedgy played by center Blaine Smith to get the ball in flight. Paul Masati lines up wide to the right. Graves operates from the shotgun. The rookie out of Syracuse. He holds 16 of his school's passing records. This pass deflected, intended for the pinball. And Graves may have thrown the football earlier than he wanted to. Well, actually, the ball hit Modine before it hit pinball. That time, Bergantz with a lot of pressure from the outside. They're trying to set up a screenplay, and Bergantz got around Schultz a little quicker than what he wanted him to. The ball hit Chomsadeen in the head. Pinball tried to get the reflection, but Chomsadeen wasn't looking for the ball. Second and 10, the ball is at the 42. Here comes the blitz. Off the ground to Paul Masati. He took it on one hop, but was attempting to try and fool the officials as he wasn't about to break stride as he continued upfield, but they waved it off almost immediately. And again, O.J. Brigance was coming from the right side. Well, when you try the slip screen, you have to slow down that outside rusher just a bit. They didn't get a hand. Chris Schultz on Brigance. He got a great jump, and he just had a straight line from quarterback Marvin Graves, and he forced him to throw it early. Third down punt by Lamley, taken by Lester Smith. And he's pulled over as he gets it up to the 46 with 5.56 remaining in the first half in a 10-10 tie at Memorial Stadium. Have struggled all season long with their kicking game. Now, punter uh, Wayne Lamley had a problem on that last punt attempt as he took the ball from Blaine Smith to center. Watch as he gets it off. Watch his left foot. Paul Clatney will roll up on his ankle right here and he sprains his ankle slightly So, and that is his plant foot on field goal and extra point attempt so it could cause him problems as the game wears on. Lamley was slow to get up and he limped off to the Argo bench. He's trying to walk it off as Baltimore scrimmages first and ten from the 46. Ham over the middle to Armstrong. Armstrong in a familiar position. He likes to cross into that middle area and Ham finds him for 25. Well, what Tracy Ham did as we saw in our opening, Chris Armstrong releases behind Don Moan. Don Moan cannot get back in the pass drop versus Chris Armstrong as he clears Moan. Ham with the perfect strike, Moan trailing. Big play once again, Chris Armstrong down to the 39-yard line. First and 10 from the 39 of the Argos. The game is tied at 10 with 5-11 remaining in the first half. Handoff inside to Drummond, and Drummond is stopped as he gets to the 35-yard line by Carlos Fowler. Don, what had set up that last play to Chris Armstronger in the last series that Baltimore had the ball, we saw the Argonaut linebackers playing at that six to seven yard depth. When Baltimore started running the ball, they had to creep back up towards the line of scrimmage. He caught Moan playing too close to the line of scrimmage. Armstrong able to release, pick up a big play on first down. For much of the year, Baltimore has operated out of a shotgun fire offense. Tracy Ham again going without a huddle. Second down, he throws deep, intended for Beals, and it's incomplete. Costello had done a good job of defending against Beals. Now, Keith Costello could run with Sean Beals. Keith Costello, the fifth-year line, veteran linebacker for the Argonauts, had the pickoff earlier in the first half that we saw that time. Got the good inside position on Sean Beals, not allowing him to work back inside underneath to make the reception. Costello coming to the Argos from the Oshawa Hawkeyes, coming out of junior football in the professional ranks. And now Donald Igwe Bike will attempt to give Baltimore the lead for the first time. Came into this game 43 of 53 on the season, Don, as long as it's 50 yards, well within his range. 
He hit two from 50 yards against Winnipeg. This one is wide. And the Argos are going to concede the single point. So Baltimore has the lead for the first time with 414 remaining. It's 11-10. Baltimore in front of Toronto. You know, even with week eight prior to that attempt, Don had been successful on seven of ten field, seven of eight field goal attempts versus the Argonauts. Only his second miss this year. He was dropped for two games. The coaching staff wasn't happy with his kicking and on September 18th and 25th Don Matthews replaced Igwe Vike with Charlie Bauman but Bauman only lasted for two games Igwe Vike was brought back and since then has responded coming into this game hitting on 16 of his last 17 including five for five in the route of Winnipeg so he was the fourth leading scorer this season in the CFL also Graves looks over the middle. It's deflected, intended for Masadi. It was knocked down at the line of scrimmage. I think it was uh, Ken Benson who got a hand on the throw. Actually, Benson got it as he came down the field, Don. He got a good drop from his middle linebacker position. As you see him flowing back, Benson leaps a former Argonaut last year, the team's leading tackler. Calvin Teagle took over that position this year, but good flow by Ken Benson, who's been primarily a backup this season, the third-year linebacker out of the University of Arizona. He missed the first 13 games of the year after breaking his leg preseason against Shreveport. He and Walton have been alternating this afternoon at the linebacking position. Double pass inside to Dwayne Ford, and it goes nowhere as the Argos are forced to send out the punting unit with 3.34 remaining in the first half. And remember, Lamley had his left leg, his plant foot and ankle rolled up on the last time he kicked. Well, that's been a, it could be a problem. He's gone and had it retaped and was checked to take on the ankle, but they'll come after him. What a beauty this time. Lester Smith has to go back to his own 35. Smith got through the first wave of downfield tacklers. That was almost slow motion. It looked as though he had been stopped. I'm sure he thought he had been stopped. And suddenly it opened up again, and he went for 20 yards. Well, Blaine Smith tried to strip him of the ball, and as Smith came by and swiped at the ball, you'll see you'll get a good look at it here. Watch Blaine Smith come in, swipe at the ball, knock it loose just a bit. Make that Leon Hatziano. He lost the ball, was able to gather it, and at that point, Argonaut defenders slowed down, and he was able to get the ball back to middle midfield. 3-10 remaining in the half. First and 10, Baltimore from the midfield strike. Ham dumps it off to Robert Drummond. Big hole over the middle. Drummond puts his shoulder down and powers into the 34. 21 yards for Robert Drummond. He had a big game against BC when he took a similar pass for a 41-yard touchdown. Okay, take it. To be with you again, I'd walk around the world. There's nothing that I wouldn't do. You had to wait for me to realize. <laughs> you I need to see your smile. Accepted in twice as many places as American Express. Visa, it's the only car you need. We gave Dodge Ram the most powerful overall line of truck engines on the planet. A driver's side airbag. The option of four-wheel anti-lock brakes. A cab design that sets a new standard for comfort and room. Then, after we made the Dodge Ram that good, we made it this bad. Introducing new Ram Sport. From Dodge, Canada's truck stop. The CFL on CBC. Brought to you by Dodge Trucks. Reinventing the truck. Under three minutes to go in Baltimore, CFLers had the lead by one, and they've got the ball in Edmonton. A big play for the BC Lions. Charles Gordon blocks a punt on the Edmonton 31-yard line. Special teams can really change the momentum in a game, and watch this. 
punts recovered by Russ Brown. He took it in for the touchdown, 17-12 BC. By the way, Danny McManus is out, and Kent Austin is in the game. The correction, Don, it wasn't Russ Brown. It was the well-known Les Brown who recovered that and took it in for the touchdown. Less of a mistake, Scott. A couple of double zeros, Les Brown for British Columbia, Donald Igwe BK here in Baltimore as Tracy Ham on first down. It's flushed out of the pocket and runs into the arms of Calvin Tiggle, a pickup of about four yards. Well, thus far, the game plan for Baltimore has played out the way they expected to be able to take advantage of Baltimore linebackers in the passing scheme of things. When we saw Robert Drummond on that previous pass reception, as he was able to circle out of the backfield, get locked one-on-one, -on -one, get that inside release, the safety in the macro was gone, the linebackers couldn't run with him. Big play on first down once again for Baltimore. Drummond at Syracuse was not only their seventh leading rusher, but one year he was also a thousand yard pass receiver. And here he is again taking the pass. Slipped initially, but continued on and heads for the end zone, but the whistle goes. This one is going to be called back. I think they quite correctly ruled that he was down. He went down on a knee at the 20 yard line. Uh, that whistle was a little quick, Don, because Robert Drummond lost his footing and he slid, but he never went down to a knee. He put that back hand down and braces it. We'll get a good look at it right here. Watch as he slides on his heels right here. He doesn't go down to a knee. He gets that hand down, maintains his balance. As he gets up, he keeps running. I don't know, James. I think that right knee may have touched. As you see him right here, he's down. That knee never touched. Robert Drumming did the right thing and keep running, kept running, and he was in the end zone, but he didn't get the call. In the end zone is Chris Armstrong, and he has a touchdown as Tracy Ham connects from 20 yards out. Armstrong led the Baltimore team with 18 regular season touchdowns, and he and Tracy Ham hook up for a major score in this postseason clash with the Yardis. And Toronto is going to have to do something with their linebackers because they've been totally ineffective on the slant route with Chris Armstrong. They're not getting deep enough in the drop. Tracy Ham has recognized that twice. He's gone to Chris Armstrong in that same spot. This time, touchdown is the result. Three passes to Armstrong for 73 yards and the touchdown. Donald Igwe Bike out of the hold of John Congemi adds the point after. And the Baltimore CFLers have increased their advantage to eight points with 204 remaining in the first half. Well, this is where Baltimore felt they could have the success. Watch underneath. You won't see any support for Crispina. The linebackers are just not getting up. When they started running the ball, they had to creep closer towards the line of scrimmage. And once they could get them to stay close, you'll see here Don Moan is just not getting back, giving his defensive back any help. And if he continues to do this, it's going to be a long night for the Argonaut secondary. 72 catches during the regular season for 1,586 yards for Armstrong. He had more yards this year than in his previous CFL experience in Edmonton and Ottawa. This is what you expect from Tracy Ham. He recognizes the weakness in the Toronto Argonaut secondary and defense. Joe Sardo had been playing that position for the past couple of games with Argonaut. The younger linebacker with a lot more foot speed. Tracy Ham recognizes that Don Moan is in there, maybe on his last leg of his pro career, and he's taking advantage of it. Mohamed Shamsuddin fumbled the kickoff, and the Baltimore CFLers are quickly there to converge on him at the 30. Don Matthews was saying he thought his special teams unit would play well in this game, and so far they've been very strong. Well, Ken Benson on that last tackle came down very strong against Modine, but momentum right now has swung back in the favor of Baltimore. They're doing all the right things. You get the big play offensively, you get the touchdown, the big tackle on the special teams, limit the return of the Argonauts. Now your defense, it's their curtain call. Dave Irwin lines up wide to the left. He's working against Irvin Smith. Inside handoff to Shamsit Modine, and he fights his way up to the 36 for a gain of about five. Stopped there by Robert Pressbury. Alvin Walton was the first man to make contact with him, as you see some work being done on the blackboard at the Baltimore bench. 
Steve Barato, along with Tracy Ham, Chris Armstrong, talking about what they recognize. We saw the scoring drive right there. Very quick drive by the CFL. Deep for Paul Masati. Incomplete. Carl Anthony had good position inside on Masati as Graves tried to go deep down the sideline. Don spoke early in the open about the composure of a Marvin Graves. He couldn't afford to get flustered. We're seeing signs of that right now. After only a short gain on first down, Marvin Graves feeling that he has to go for it all to Paul Mazzotti. The ball was poorly underthrown. Carl Anthony with great field position. Wayne Lamley back on punting once again. Another good kick by Lamley. Smith takes it back at his 33-yard line. And he's down as he hits the 44. And one thing Don Matthews stressed to his team coming into this game, hang on to the football. We don't want a repeat of what happened last week in the final game of the season against Sacramento when we were shut out 18-0 and fumbled 11 times. Well, he did a fine job. Watch the contact. Smith had great concentration on the football, held on to it as he was tackled there by Eddie Thomas. But right now, Toronto must stop Baltimore. They cannot afford another score prior to halftime. They have to keep it close right here at 15-7. 18-10. You confused me for a moment there, James. Penalty flag. Pass over the middle. Knocked away at the last moment by Kevin Whitley as it was intended for Armstrong. Well, the 15 points is what Baltimore scored here in the second quarter. They've gotten their offense on track, and the Argonauts have been playing on their heels. Offside call against Toronto. Offside. Toronto 77. Five-yard penalty. First down or two. Rodney Harding, who had 16 quarterback sacks this year and is the Argos' all-time leader in that department with 89, moved prior to the ball being snapped. <laughs> First and five, Baltimore, 121 remaining. Hand off to Robert Drummond, and Drummond got back to the line of scrimmage. And no further, it will be second and five. Second five, Don, probably the most critical play of the first half coming up here because Toronto, if they can if they can disallow Baltimore picking up another first down, be a great advantage, forcing them into a punting situation. But if they pick it up with the momentum that Baltimore has, they can possibly go down and get another score prior to halftime. And this time sends two receivers wide to the left. He marks out the signals from the shotgun. He's in some trouble. Harding is after him and has got him. <laughs> Big defensive play by the Argos with 54 seconds remaining in the first half. I think that will atone for the offside that Rodney Harding had two plays ago where he cost his team the first down. On first down, comes back now with the sack and really a coverage sack. The secondary did a good job of not allowing a receiver to come open. Don Moan came late on a delayed blitz. Flush Tracy Ham up in the pocket. Rodney Harding at home gets the sack. Rodney Harding was telling me that his life has been made somewhat easier with the addition of Jeff Fields to the lineup in that many times they have to double team the big defensive tackle and that enables him to come up a seam and register a sack which he has done 16 times this year. And he brought down Tracy Ham for a loss back to the 45 yard line forcing Baltimore to send out Josh Miller and the punting unit. That's the second highest single season total in Argonaut history. Who was the guy who had the highest in Argo history? We'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mike Pinball Clemens penalty flag as Clemens brings it back to the 23 yard line. The flag is back at the eight yard line. Yes, 22 sacks in 1984 was it for a fellow named James Kirk. Ancient history. <laughs> I like the way you led into that. The second highest total all time in Argo history. Hey, you know, I, I needed you beg the question. Who <laughs> set the record? Let, let me see if I got any <laughs> gratuity money in my pocket here. You better have lots. <laughs> well, the Argonauts had a great return by Mike Clemens. Illegal block. Toronto 24. Half the distance to the goal line. First down. Ken Walcott, the culprit on that. Illegal block for the Argonauts that are going to pin them inside the five-yard line. Clemens had returned the ball out across the 20, and they were going to have decent field position with 41 seconds to go in the half. 
now Marvin Gray really needs to pick up a first down. He's gone a couple of series without one. He needs one now. This is really where they need a first down, as you said, and he sends three receivers wide to the left, gives the ball to the pinball, and the pinball got up to the four and was stopped there by Matt Goodwin. Well, Goodwin, as we've known all season long, has been the defensive leader for this Baltimore team. When he, at the start of the season, he started out as a backup defensive back, eventually moved to the outside wheel linebacker position. This game started at the MAC, middle linebacker position, where his brother normally plays, who missed this game because of injury. Ken Benson was moved to the outside in his normal position, but he has been making the plays. Baltimore now has utilized their timeout to try to preserve as much time as they can on the clock. But Matt, Matt Goodwin has had an outstanding first half. Well, Goodwin was one of those players that Don Matthews spoke about yesterday. He said it took us some time to find the right position for him to play. And, and that's crit critical to the experience of the coaching staff of Baltimore, that they took the time. They knew the young man would be an asset for the team. They didn't want to make a wrong move, so they experimented with a couple of positions, and it turned out he was the team's outstanding defensive player nominee this year. Toronto has to get a first down here. Baltimore is going to get the ball back in excellent field position. And as Graves tried to roll left, he slipped and fell at the line of scrimmage. And uh, calling the timeout was a wise decision by Don Matthews because now he's going to get the ball back. 31 seconds remaining in the half. The footing, once again, as we see, has been a problem for the players, especially the Argonauts. Not accustomed to playing on the natural surface as Marvin Graves came with the naked boot. He seemed like he had the corner, but as he tried to pull up, once again, he planted on his heels. Not good footing. Alvin Walton right there to touch him down. Now Wayne Lamley ever so pressed to get off his best punt of the ball game. He'll try and let the clock run right down before launching this kick. Ten seconds remain on the 20-second clock, 18 seconds on the game clock. Don, nevertheless, Baltimore will get the ball within field goal range. Well, it will certainly be within Donald Igwe Bique's kicking range. As I mentioned earlier, twice against Winnipeg, he split the uprights from 50 yards up. You know, the smartest thing that Wayne Lamley could do once he got the ball would be run to his right with the ball, run a few seconds off the clock, kick the ball out of the end zone, because once Baltimore recovered it, time would have run off the clock, and they would not get a field goal attempt. But he's going to punt this one right away. Eight seconds remaining. Lamley stands about 15 yards deep in the end zone. 18-10. Baltimore leads. Don, you know, Wayne Lamley has to be feeling a lot of pressure here. He's had one punt blocked already tonight. He has the bad ankle that was rolled up on by Clantney. And he knows that Baltimore is going to be pinning back their ears, coming after him. So his line really has to give him some time. He needs to get the ball off in two strides if he's going to punt it. One of the reasons for the delay, I think there was some concern about the time clock, but they have checked, and it remains at eight seconds, although they are still having a discussion. You know, we've talked about Wayne Lamley. Blaine Smith needs to get a perfect snap back to his punter also. Needs to get him the ball with an adequate amount of time. And what about conceding a safety touch? Now he should kick it. You know, Don, he had a clear lane to kick the ball. If he had kicked it out in the open field and then it arose, there's three seconds left on the clock. No way could a Baltimore defender got to the ball quick enough to down it to give Igwe Bleke a time, a chance after a three-point field goal. Well, you know, we talked about Wayne Lamley at the start of the telecast as being key to success for the Toronto Argonauts. He took five seconds off the clock, but, you know, I think that's easier said than done, kicking the ball on the dead run. Let's go down to the sidelines now to Scott. All right, Don, coming up on Live at the Half uh, from Baltimore today, we'll update you on the latest from uh, Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton. 
And we'll go live to Winnipeg to talk with Cal Murphy, head coach and general manager of the Bombers, and Ottawa running back and uh, former Bomber Michael Richardson on the eve of their East Division semifinal game. That's all coming up on Live at the Half just a few seconds from now. Yes, two weeks ago, everyone in Baltimore thought that the road to the Grey Cup in the CFL East would lead through Baltimore, but then with Winnipeg's win last week over Toronto and the upsets of the CFLers by Sacramento provided Winnipeg with a first-place finish, and in the event that both Baltimore and Winnipeg win semifinal games, the Eastern Final will take place next Sunday at Winnipeg Stadium. So after the two-point safety touch, making it 20 to 10, Wayne Lamley kicks off a squib kick that Lester Smith fields at the 30-yard line. And that will do it for the first half here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore with the first-year CFL team heading to the dressing room with a 10-point lead. Scott? All right, Don, through 30 minutes, the Baltimore CFLers have shown more of the stuff that's established them as one of the all-time finest expansion teams in any sport. Stand by now for Live of the Half from Baltimore. We took the most comfortable full-size pickup on the road and made it more comfortable. We took the most thoughtful interior on the market and made it more thoughtful. We took the biggest cab in the industry and made it bigger. The new Dodge Ram Club Cab. First we changed the rules, then we stretched them. From Dodge, Canada's truck stop. CBC News World, Canada's news and information network, 24 hours a day. We go the distance to bring you a Canadian view of the world. CBC News World, news on the hour, information around the clock. In Passé, Quebec, there's only one word that describes this situation. <laughs> It's a bird that grows on you. After 22 years of watching and studying the birds, Lucy Lagoo feels closer to them each day. Thousands! Oh, everybody's heard about the bird. Janet Gazing, when we're on the road again, Tuesday at 7. You break the leaves and put away the lawn furniture. Now as you brace yourself for the holiday season, another annual event creeps up. The Grey Cup. It's been going on for years. Time to get together with friends and watch the game. Maybe have that last barbecue. For all of us, it's become a tradition. Yeah, there are a lot of things you can do, but only one place you can be. The Grey Cup on CBC, November 27th.
Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. This East Division semifinal, barring overtime, is half over, and it's the CFLers by 10. It's semifinal Saturday East and West today at Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton. The defending Grey Cup champion Eskimos are at the half in their West Division semifinal with the BC Lions. And let us recap now what has happened to this point in Edmonton. The Eskimos opened the scoring with a couple of singles, but the first major of the game was by BC. Sean Millington on the handoff from Danny McManus, 34-yard run, 12 minutes into the game. BC led 7-2. Then the Grey Cup champions took the lead on a big play. Damon Allen over the middle to downtown Eddie Brown, who turned it upfield. Play went 60 yards and produced six points. Edmonton led 12-7 in the second quarter. But how about this for a change in momentum? Special teams can do it. Charles Gordon blocked the punt. Les Brown recovered and took it in for the Lions. BC led 17-12. And a 42-yard field goal by Lou Pisaglia extended BC's lead to 20-12. Lions starting quarterback Danny McManus didn't make it to the first half. He's injured and out. Kent Austin in in his place. By the way, Austin separated his shoulder here in Baltimore only three weeks ago. So the Eskimos have open playoff defense of their Grey Cup championship. And at halftime, they trail by eight. We'll keep you updated highlight by highlight. The other two CFL semifinals go tomorrow. In Winnipeg, the first-place Bombers host Ottawa. Cal Murphy joins us live from there now. Cal, your team went 13-5 uh, and five this year. Ottawa, 4-14. Four and 14. I guess that pretty much means that uh, you have everything to lose and nothing to gain in the semifinal tomorrow. Are you nervous about it? Well, I guess it goes both ways, Scott. If uh, they lose, they go home. If we lose, we go home. Naturally, uh, we're nervous about it because uh, it's uh, down to a one-game deal, and uh, it's important that you win. Let me ask you about what's often the biggest part of any game in Winnipeg in November, and that's the weather. Are you going to have home ice advantage for the semifinal? <laughs> no, it's going to be pretty nice weather, really. Uh, really, right now, it's uh, fairly warm here, and uh, as you can see, all I've got is a jacket on, and uh, uh, you know, I, we anticipate it'll be... Uh, up to uh, plus five or better tomorrow. Callan, two games against uh, you this season. Ottawa surrendered 105 points. And I know because I live in Winnipeg, you've had to work really hard this week to uh, make Ottawa sound like a credible opponent. I shudder to think what might happen if the Bombers were to lose this game. Well, I guess uh, just like anybody else, if you lose, you lose. Uh, you don't go out to play a game to lose, but uh, those things happen any time you go out and play a game. and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that uh, there are uh, uh, people on the Ottawa football team that they think they, they can win, too, So and uh, rightfully so. That's why you play the game. Cal, a couple of weeks ago, you got a real spanking here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, and your final regular season game against the Argos last week was, uh, I guess, closer than you would have liked. Uh, does the way the regular season ended for you make you nervous at all? Well, I think considering everything that uh, we had go wrong uh, with injuries and whatnot, I think uh, it ended fairly well, and uh, I anticipate that, uh, you know, I think we practiced awfully well uh, this past week, and I think we practiced well even after the Baltimore game. We played well last week. Uh, Toronto's a good football team, and, uh, uh, you know, they're giving the, the uh, flagship franchise all they want right now, so I guess uh, they must have something. All right, Cal, I want to thank you for your time and good luck in your East Division semifinal tomorrow. Okay. Bombers and Ottawa on the second CFL East Division semifinal tomorrow at Winnipeg Stadium. When we come back with more on Live at the Half, we'll talk to one of the Ottawa principals, Rob Ryder running back, also a former bomber, Michael Richardson, will join us live from Winnipeg Stadium. Here at Memorial Stadium at the Half, it's the CFLers by 10. It's time to make your run out into the country as invigorating as your run out into the country. The performance of the Mazda MX-6 Mystere. It's all about working and living, catching your breath, and driving your Mazda. There really are roads like this. When you find one, be ready. The Mazda Miata. It's all about working and living, cranking the tunes, and driving your Mazda. Welcome to Subway. Subway isn't like those fancy New York steakhouses. No stuffy mater d' or jackets required. Great vest. 
steak. But we do have A1 steak sauce. It's on Subway's new A1 steak and cheese. Slices of tender, juicy, seasoned steak topped with a great taste of A1. Plus all the fresh fixings you like. And at Subway, you don't get a big bill. You get change. Subway's new A1 steak and cheese. Appetites are required. Jackets aren't. What good is an answering machine that just isn't answering anymore? Get Bell Call Answer Service. It even takes messages while you're on the phone. Call Answer Service and the Vista 200 phone are both free for a month. Plus, you'll save the $18 connection charge. Call 1-800-668-3901 or visit your Bell Phone Center store by November 12th. Hello, I'm Carol McNeil. And I'm David Kyle. Join us Monday, November 14th at 11 o'clock for a special hour-long edition of the CBC Windsor Lake Week. We'll have complete coverage of the municipal and school board election results from Windsor and the county. Percy Hatfield will be reporting live out of Windsor City Hall, and our journalists will fan out across the region to bring you all the latest results on voting night. So join us Monday, November 14th for a special hour-long edition of the CBC Windsor Lake News. On CBC Windsor. I'll be my special angel. A loving father. My dad. A small child. What about your dad? I did nothing to kill him. I'm going to get him. Your dad? Gilbert Jonathan Farrell. Yes. Big fat ugly liar. Both of you! I didn't lie, Mom! Is it your sister who is lying or is it your father? Kate Nelligan. Art Hindle. Vanessa King. What have you done to this family now? Liar Liar, Sunday night at 8 on CBC. The sun has set in Maryland. There's the Inner Harbor at night. The lights are also on at Memorial Stadium. The CFLers are home and leading 2010. Welcome back now as we continue with Live at the Half. As we've said, the winner of this game meets the winner of tomorrow's Ottawa Winnipeg semifinal. And now from Winnipeg Stadium, we're joined live by uh, Rough Rider running back and the former bomber, Michael Richardson. Well, Michael, you know that uh, they're saying at 4-14, four and 14, the Rough Riders don't deserve to be in the playoffs. But uh, I'm guessing that at no point did uh, you and your teammates think about declining the playoff spot. Well, we didn't write the records. I mean, 4-14 four and 14 doesn't sound like a team should be in the, in the playoffs, but we're here. We're not going to give it up just because we, people say we're not supposed to be here. Michael, from your years in Winnipeg, you know well how tough it is for visiting teams to win at Winnipeg Stadium in November. When you were a member of the Bombers, did you have a feeling of invincibility when teams came to play you in the playoffs? Oh, definitely. I mean, if we ever got a playoff game, we considered our we considered it as a great cup berth. So um, I'm sure these guys haven't changed any since I left. It's only been a year, you know. Uh, I'm sure they're, they're thinking they're going to blow us out or, you know, take advantage of every opportunity they can. Michael, how big an upset would it be if the Rough Riders could pull it off in Winnipeg tomorrow? Uh, big enough to get us to the next round. Well, that's a pretty simple answer. You know, Michael, on paper, the Rough Riders had a very good team at the start of the season, but something went terribly wrong. Have you been able to put your finger on it? No, I don't, I don't think anyone was able to put their finger on it. I think uh, no excuses for uh, play in the, in the past uh, 18 weeks. I think uh, injuries had something to do with it, but I don't think that that was a total, you know, the, the, the total thing that was wrong with the whole team. You could fix a lot of things tomorrow, as we say, if you're able to pull off the upset. Have you and your teammates talked at all about the 81 Rough Riders who finished 5-11 and 11 and went all the way to the Grey Cup and gave the Eskimos a scare? No, we, well, we haven't talked about it this week, but I'll make sure I say something about it tomorrow in the dressing room. There now, I've given you the inspirational message for the game tomorrow. You missed, uh, Michael, a lot of the season with uh, an injury. Is tomorrow the day that you earn your money? I hope so. I hope so, Scott. All right, Mike Richardson, want to thank you for coming back to Winnipeg Stadium to talk to us tonight, and good luck tomorrow. Thanks a lot, Scott. So it's the Bombers and Rough Riders and the other East Division semifinal tomorrow in Winnipeg. And here are the particulars. Telecast starts at 3 Eastern, 2 local time. Riders haven't had a winning record in 15 seasons, but they've made the playoffs in each of the last five. Last time they won an East semifinal was 1982. Now here in Baltimore, the CFLers are pinning their hopes on quarterback Tracy Hamm. And Don, certainly late in the first half, he was equal to the challenge. 
Well, you're absolutely correct, Scott. Tracy Ham was a little slow in getting started. As a matter of fact, the Argos were first on the board. They also scored the game's first touchdown. A 49-yard strike from quarterback Marvin Graves to Bobby Gordon set up the touchdown run by Mohamed Shamsuddin. Marvin Graves showed a lot of composure in the first quarter and moving his team down the field. And when they got in the scoring position, Shamsuddin was able to take it in. And then Baltimore came back. Robert Drummond able to take it in from short yardage. Reggie Pleasant wasn't able to make the stop. Baltimore at this point drew even. And the CFLers, once they got that momentum, it was hard to stop. A block punt was also a factor for Baltimore. And who else but Matt Goodwin, who blocked three during the regular season, getting through on Wayne Lamley. Had been a trouble spot all year long for the Argonauts specialty team. But as we spoke about in the opening, the linebackers presented a special problem for the Argonauts. Argonauts. They just hadn't been getting deep in their pass drops. As we saw, Chris Armstrong and Tracy Ham hook up on three separate occasions. This one for a touchdown. They got no underneath support. The Argonauts secondary. Baltimore took advantage of it. Three receptions for the leading receiver for Baltimore, Chris Armstrong, for 73 yards and a major score. While Toronto had the better passing yardage in the first quarter, they had no passing yards in the second quarter. A slow start for Baltimore, but the CFLers came on in the second quarter. They only had 80 first quarter yards, 196 in total for the half, and they lead by a score of 20 to 10. Scott? All right, Don, it's already been an extraordinarily successful season for the expansion Baltimore CFLers, and now here they are, only 30 minutes away from a spot in the East Division Final. Stay tuned, the second half kickoff is up next from Baltimore, Maryland. Look at that face. It's not a happy face. What, are you waiting for your computer company to pick up the phone? Don't they realize the reason you're here tonight is because you have to be finished in the morning? You know what your mistake is? You're a person. See, if you were a big fancy corporation, 16 guys would be all over you apologizing by now. Or maybe your mistake is you're holding for the wrong company. From Gillette comes a revolutionary form of antiperspirant protection. Gillette Clear Gel Antiperspirant. Because it's a clear, clean, highly effective gel, it goes on smoothly with no white residue to form an invisible barrier of protection. All day protection against both wetness and odor. Gillette Clear Gel Antiperspirant. One of the advanced deodorants and antiperspirants in the Gillette series. Right now at McDonald's, you can enjoy a regular cup of our premium blend coffee for just 49 cents. And as always, refills are free. At McDonald's today. Introducing November's Taste of the Month. We've added tomato, processed Swiss cheese, and ham to the already popular McChicken and called it the McChicken Supreme. But it won't be around in December, so you've got to show up now. that if anything can go wrong, it will. Murphy probably didn't use Valvoline motor oil. People who know use Valvoline. Welcome back to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, where the CFLers, under the direction of Tracy Ham, lead by 10 points. A bit of a slow start for Baltimore, but in the second quarter, Tracy Ham began throwing strikes, and the favorite target was Chris Armstrong. Three receptions for 73 yards and a major score. Ham in the first half was good on 11 of 18, and he spread the ball around. He used all of his receivers. Over on the other side of the field, Marvin Graves started strongly in the first quarter. He had two big hits, one to Paul Massotti, the other to Bobby Gordon, but he was unable to complete a pass in the second quarter of the ball game, and that's when Baltimore took control. So now Graves will have to get his act going in the second half if 
Toronto is going to pull an upset at Memorial State. Don, one of the things we had talked about was the composure of a young Marvin Graves and how would he react as the game carried on. Another thing for Toronto in their favor is that they have Mike Kerrigan waiting in the bullpen. He's healthy once again, so if Graves continues to struggle, Obilovich has a veteran quarterback to go to. Take on the reverse with Lester Smith. Smith cuts it back inside. He has really done an excellent job of kick returning today for Baltimore. That was a 21-yard run back. As we see the special teams once again causing problems for the Argonauts, not, not, not coming down, doing a good job in covering Lester Smith. Baltimore with great field position out at the 41. We'll see it here. The fake to Drummond as he comes around. Smith keeps the ball. What happens in this is you'll get some players out of their lane and evidence that time with Argonaut. And Smith didn't become a regular kick returner with Baltimore until week 11 of the CFL season. But he's a fixture back there now for Don Matthews' team. First and 10 from the 41. And the handoff to Drummond. Drummond following the blocking of Big Neal for it. And he takes it up to the 48-yard line. Calvin Tickle came over to make the tackle. We talked about Tracy Ham using all of his receivers. Drummond caught four, but the most yardage was accumulated by slotback Chris Armstrong. You know, the key to that, Don, is with six different receivers, you can't get a pin when you're the secondary of the Argonauts to where the ball is going to go. He hasn't given you any keys and so he can spread the defense out. Second down and three. Drummond spun off the initial hit, tried to reach forward but was stopped at the 50-yard line by Rodney Hardy. Carlos Fowler wrapped him up as he tried to come off the pile It looked like Drummond might be able to escape and pick up some extra yardage. Hardy Harding with the initial surge, but Fowler there to finish. Great surge by the defense, but Baltimore is going to go for it. Look like a third down gamble here, Don. Ball is just shy of the 50-yard line. It will be third and one. And the offense, to the delight of this large crowd at Memorial Stadium, stays on the field. Most of the time in the CFL, this is a given because of the yard off of the line of scrimmage. But the offensive line still needs to get off and get that surge. Oh, this is going to be close. He did Tracy Ham was hit by Carlos Fowler. Tracy Ham tried to go to his left, and the Argos think they've stopped him. He's not even close, Don. He did. He only got back to the line of scrimmage. Great job by Fowler. Ham tried to take the ball and come off of the left tackle. If he had gone right behind off of the line, he would have picked it up. But the Argonauts with the big defensive stand get the turnover. Now maybe the offense can build some momentum and get some points out of this. They're calling for a measurement, but he got back to the 50, and he had to be beyond the 50 to get a first down. So what you referred to, James, as a given was not. Well, they <laughs> gave the ball away. Normally it is. If you follow the rule of the tape, duck right in behind your massive offensive line, don't do anything too fancy. That time, watch Tracy Ham as he tries to come behind Sharp or Donish to left off of the tackle, but Fowler was untouched. Calvin Teagle right there lending support. Don Moan filling the gap. Big play Argonaut. Now Marvin Graves needs to show that composure. They take over first and ten from the 50 of Baltimore. Graves for Masadi. Masadi ran into some traffic. They were trying to set up the slip screen, trying to bring Masadi back inside, but there were just too many bodies for Masadi to avoid. Tried to get Burgos and Jovanovich out in front of him, but Gerald Bayless recognized the play. Gerald Bayless has been around many years in the CFL. Takes a lot to fool Gerald. Recognized what was occurring. Got out on Masani to limit the gain on the play. Masadi again lines up wide to the right as Dave Irwin goes off to the left. Graves in the shotgun. Here comes the blitz. Graves throws over the middle, and he overthrows Paul Masadi. He had to hurry that throw as pressure was coming up the middle. Lester Smith came from his safety position late, and that's one of the things that they're doing to disguise the coverage on Marvin Graves. As Graves reads the secondary, watch Lester Smith come from the top of your screen, comes late, comes through clean, jumps it in, gets a shoulder on him, but he's right in the face of Marvin Graves, forces him to throw it early. Now Lester Smith heads back as a punt return man. The lone man back for Baltimore, and he takes the ball back to the 18-yard line. 11.53 remaining in the third quarter. Baltimore continues to hang on to a 10-point lead. 
Marathon Ford in Leamington is a proud sponsor of the CFL on the CBC Windsor. It's my kind of game, Ma. It's fast and exciting. Exciting like buying a new car or truck at Marathon Ford. Leasing too, Ma. Yeah. Folks, you owe it to yourself to check out a marathon deal. Yeah. Like the CFL, we're not the only game in town, but you like the way we do business. Okay, son, go for a long one. Marathon Ford Leamington. Oh, keep an eye out for a little old lady with a great arm. Or better yet, me, the Cardio King, for a great deal. Hi, welcome to Subway. Subway isn't like those fancy New York steakhouses. No stuffy mater d' or jackets required. Great vest. Thanks. But we do have A1 steak sauce. It's on Subway's new A1 steak and cheese. Slices of tender, juicy, seasoned steak topped with a great taste of A1. Plus all the fresh fixings you like. And at Subway, you don't get a big bill. You get change. Subway's new A1 steak and cheese. Appetites are required. Jackets aren't. What? good as an answering machine that just isn't answering anymore. Get Bell Call Answer Service. It even takes messages while you're on the phone. Call Answer Service and the Vista 200 phone are both free for a month. Plus, you'll save the $18 connection charge. Call 1-800-668-3901 or visit your Bell Phone Center store by November 12th. Here in Baltimore, C.F. Feller is still leading the Argos by 10, uh, 3.07 into the second half of the game. Well, Willie Burden had uh, never heard of Mike Pringle until this year and vice versa. Now they know each other. Uh, Willie Burden made a special presentation to Mike Pringle at halftime, and it was all about uh, Pringle breaking Willie's 19-year-old CFL single-season rushing record. You show up here today, meet Mike Pringle for the first time. What's your first reaction when he's in street clothes? <laughs> well, I thought I was going to get a chance to see him play and uh, kind of compare styles a little bit, but he was on the sidelines with me most of the first half. But uh, from everything I understand about him and have heard about him, he's just a great running back. And uh, I'm very proud to be a part of his uh, celebration here this weekend. Okay, Willie, hang on. We'll get right back to you, Don. And with Mike Pringle out of the lineup, it is Robert Drummond, who is the ball carrier for Baltimore. And he picks up about three more yards. Scott? You know, Willie, Don Whitman called uh, your record-setting yardage in 1975 with Calgary. He's doing the game today, by the way. But were you starting to think that the record was never going to fall? It stood for 19 years. Well, uh, I've been in uh, sports long enough to know that every record will be broken at some point. And, uh, hey, I, I, I was the caretaker taker of that record for some 19 years, and I'm pleased with that. I don't think it could have lasted any longer than that, and uh, I'm sure someone's going to be coming out to Mike Pringle pretty soon. Willie, good to see you again. You look great. Thank you. Don? Chewy Pelotu is the man that Gracie Ham goes to, and Kenny Thomas makes the tackle, and it's a first down Baltimore. I like the way Willie Burton called that record performance of his he said I was just the caretaker of the record just the caretaker Willie Burton a great athlete has been a tremendous inspiration outside the game he is now the athletic director at North Carolina State his alma mater great success for Willie Burton beyond the game of football he still looks fit enough to play eh, most of us <laughs> don't even think that anymore Tracy Ham fakes it to his Peloto. Now he's going to run away from Carlos Fowler, and widely he decides to go down as he had two defensive backs moving up on him, but he's got another first down. You know, James, when you look back at this game, if the Argos lose, they will reflect on their inability to score off two key turnovers, an interception and stopping Baltimore in third down. Well, inability to score, but also, Don, the inability of the linebackers for the Argonauts to be effective. Calvin Teagle has done a fine job in stopping the run, but the Argonauts have had a lot of problems in their pass coverage with their linebackers. That time they ran off, turned their backs, Tracy Ham kept the ball. First and ten from the 48. The handoff to Drummond. Drummond bounces to the outside. He's a tough man to bring down when he gets up ahead of steam. And it is Tommy Henry who finally stops him. But that will be close to another Baltimore first down. And once again, we can go back into that page of the linebackers. There was no outside run support that time as Drummond got to the corner. Tommy Henry had to come up out of the secondary to make the stop. Unless these linebackers outside Keith Costello, along with Don Moe, can add more support, run, and pass, it will be a long night the rest of the way for the Argonauts. And with 25 minutes, or almost 25 minutes still remaining in this game, Baltimore has already run for more yards 
than they did in their two previous games against Toronto. The thing was that everyone felt that with Mike Pringle out of the lineup that the running game would be totally inept. In the first quarter, it was non-effective. But Tracy Ham found ways to start throwing the ball. And once he opened up that passing attack, it softened up the linebackers away from the line of scrimmage. We saw earlier where they were playing at a six and seven yard depth. And when they started doing that, all of a sudden he knew that his running game would open up. So he kept the ball on the ground. Second and one, Baltimore. After a most disappointing season last year as a member of the Argos, Tracy Ham has regained the form he displayed in Edmonton. His confidence has been fully restored, and one of the reasons he is having success is he is able to call all of his own plays. On second and a yard, Drummond tried to pick up the first down and uh, got to the line of scrimmage, was hit there by Don Moan and Swift Birch. Yeah, we get a good look at Calvin Teagle, the middle linebacker, the run stopper for the Argonauts, putting that hat right on Robert Drummond as he gets to the hole with Swift Birch closing. You know, you talked about Tracy Ham on the previous sequence there, Don, about him having his confidence restored. Tracy Ham was just in a bad system for Tracy Ham. That's a tough system for any quarterback. Tracy Ham, we know, is an outside mobile quarterback who likes to get out press the corner, read what the defense is doing. They had him in a three-step drop situation. He wasn't comfortable in the offense. He didn't have the right personnel around him. Last year, the Argonauts gave up 83 quarterback sacks. Tracy Ham went down quite often, and he just could not get comfortable in that offense. Came here to Baltimore in a revamped offense that suited Tracy Ham. He's back to the Tracy Ham of old. Ham failed to make it on a third down gamble the last time Baltimore had the football. Don, I bet you he'll go right behind the offensive line this time. Nothing fancy. Follow the Earl Twins playing the guard, flanking Nick Stubas in center, and Tracy Ham picks up the first down. That's veteran Tracy Ham. He's not going to be foolish twice. He took the wrong read the first time. Hey, I'm not going to do it again. Guy Earl is in at a starting left guard position, replacing Keith Ballard, who broke his leg last week. And his twin brother, John, plays the right guard position, number 60 and 63. The first time the twins have ever started together in a football game. Tui Pelotu is close to another Baltimore first down as he is stopped at the 42 of Toronto. Right now, the Argonaut defense has been on the field a long time in this drive. Tracy Ham has moved the ball around. He's mixed it well, run versus pass. And the linebackers, as we saw in that last play, Teagle on Tui Pelotu, is just a mismatch. And every time that Tracy Ham can get a linebacker locked one-on-one, -on -one, on one of his receivers, either running back or wide out, he's going to go there. Four receivers wide to the right this time. Tui Peloto is split to the left. Handoff inside to Drummond, that quick opener, and it is stopped after a pickup of about one. It's going to be another third and short situation for Baltimore. Tracy Ham picked up the last one. He should be successful on this attempt also if they come up short on the measurement. Short yardage unit comes in, Borelli and Miller, and Sheldon Canley with Armstrong, Wilson, and Clark going out. And uh, Toronto is adding some beef on that defensive line also and bringing in Mike Campbell to put a five-man defensive line front end. Drummond, the ball carrier, he breaks. Good stick arm as Drummond with speed heads to the end zone touchdown what a stiff arm Drummond threw into Reggie Pleasant after breaking the line of scrimmage but there is a penalty flag back at the line of scrimmage early movement by one of the Baltimore offensive linemen is going to negate that tremendous run by Robert Drummond excellent athletic maneuver by Drummond to put the stiff arm on Reggie Pleasant Explode in the corner, outrun Eddie Thomas into the corner, but it's all for not done. Illegal procedure, Baltimore right guard, five-yard penalty, 
third down repeated. John Earl is guilty of the procedure. And that negates a great touchdown run by Robert Drummond. But watch the stiff arm as we see the uh, premature movement by Earl. And I guess we're not going to get an opportunity to see the uh, straight arm that Drummond threw at Reggie Pleasant. But and Steve he, was, him. <laughs> he wasn't too pleased about that offensive coordinator and offensive line coach Steve Barato, longtime companion of Don Matthews on his coaching staff. Wasn't pleased about that move. Pinball Clemens takes the ball at the 20. He could lose some valuable yardage here. He's back at the 10. 6.54 is the time remaining in the third quarter. One company believes you can't put a price on safety. So every year, they conduct four times the number of crash tests required by law. Because there's always more to learn. And because when it comes to building safer vehicles, they think government requirements are just the starting point. The company is General Motors. We reserve bed and breakfast for 25 homes downtown Toronto, so we really depend on our long distance. Great service. Rates are the same as anybody else out there, if not better. Every day, more and more businesses are switching back to Bell. When you called them, they were there all the time, especially on repairs. So give us a call, and we'll prove that we can give your business an advantage. Bell Advantage. Bell has been great for us. We're happy to be back with them. Bell, what took you so long? <laughs> Folks, if selection is what you're after, under Lanoue Pontiac Buick and Telbury is the place. We have over 350 vehicles for you to browse through, check out, and test drive. Need a New Year's truck? We got them from 4x4s to Dooley's. Sit behind the wheel of a 94 Buick and see how easy it can be yours. We have all the 94 Pontiacs from Sunbirds to Bonneville. And how about a top quality used car or truck? If we don't have what you're looking for, then you're one tough customer. But then again, we built our reputation on making people like you happy. Back to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, still the CFLer is holding on to a 10-point lead, 6.54 to go in the second quarter, and the Argos pinned deep in their own end. And here's what's happening at Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton in the West Division semifinal between the Eskimos and the BC Lions. It's now 2015 BC. Uh, the Eskimos have closed to within five on a 40-yard field goal by Sean Fleming, Don. And here at Memorial Stadium, 20 to 10, Baltimore leads as Graves has problems with his footing again and goes down at the five-yard line. O.J. Brigance was there to make sure he stayed down with 6.33 remaining in the third quarter. On the last two plays, the attempted punt return by Clemens and this pass attempt by Graves, Toronto has lost. 14 yards. One of the common problems when you have a young player that's not accustomed to moving on to the natural surface. He spent his entire season playing on the grass or on the artificial surface at Sky Dome. Now he comes down on the grass. He's had a lot of foot problems. Over the middle to Crepo and this will be a first down and a very vital first down at the 25-yard line, a gain of 20. Don, when Marvin Graves was in trouble earlier in the year when he first got the starting nod as the Argonaut quarterback, he liked going to Rod Crefo. Crefo at six foot six, a very easy target with very soft hands as he comes across the middle. But Graves had the time back in his own end zone, a risky area to throw a pass from, but he came up with the first down. Graves remained calm and cool as he stood back in the end zone and picked out the big slot back. Now he gives to Clemens, and Clemens appears to slip as he goes down at the 25-yard line. Don, one of the problems you get in playing in this Baltimore area, as it gets cooler, you get a dew that builds up on top of the grass, so it becomes very slick. And I think that's the major problem that the Argonauts are having right now with their footing. Nothing that they can really do about it because they're not accustomed to playing in a cool climate with natural surface. Yeah, they were in Edmonton early in the year. <laughs> Dude, well, it may have rained. Okay. It was warm, though. 
second and ten. Pass is complete to Bobby Gordon. This will be another Toronto first down. Again, a very big second down play. Graves stands in there and drills the pass into the hands of the receiver. If you look at the two passes, the past two passes that Marvin Graves has thrown, he's thrown them underneath on circle routes to Rob Crefo and now this time to Bobby Gordon. What they've done is they've driven off the inside halfbacks, came back underneath, and there's been that open lane because Baltimore has been blitzing with their linebackers. First and 10, the ball is at the 33. Fake inside to Clemens. Graves steps up, throws the ball over the middle, and Matt Goodwin knocked it away. It was intended for Paul Masati. Graves may have briefly seen an opening through the seam, but Goodwin very quickly came over to close it off. Don, I think he locked on his receiver because initially Goodwin, 39, in the middle of your screen, came toward the line of scrimmage, locked in on Graves. He dropped off where Marvin was looking, got a good drop, went up, got both hands on the football as Gordon was coming on a crossing route. But Goodwin with the great defensive play once again for Baltimore. Another big second down play for Marvin Graves and the Toronto Argonauts. He's converted both of his two previous second down and long situations. He won't do it this time as he looks to the sidelines for Dave Irwin. And the Argos send out the punting unit, but they'll be punting from a little better spot than they might have been had Graves not connected when he stood back in the end zone and threw over the middle to Creeper. Don, even though Marvin Graves completed two of those second and long situations for first downs, what he needs to do now is pick up yardage on first down. Five to six yards, so he's in a second and short and no longer in that second and ten. Again, Baltimore almost got to the third down punt and upfield as the CFLers bounce in the football, penalty flags fly. That was only a 22-yard kick. From antifreeze to air filters to wiper blades, inside, outside, top to bottom, Canadian Tire has you covered. Because we have the experience that comes from servicing over 10,000 cars every day and more than 65,000 auto parts and products which means we help maintain more cars than anyone. So whatever you need, come to the one place with everything, Canadian Tire. There's a lot more for your car for a lot less. From Gillette comes a revolutionary form of antiperspirant protection. Gillette Clear Gel Antiperspirant. Because it's a clear, clean, highly effective gel, it goes on smoothly with no white residue to form an invisible barrier of protection. All day protection against both wetness and odor. Gillette Clear Gel Antiperspirant. One of the advanced deodorants and antiperspirants in the Gillette series. If the only mouse you've ever heard of has four legs and a passion for cheese, then get ready. The big computer companies are after you. Robert Scully takes a look at the exploding home computer market. Venture right after Sunday reports. Will be Saturday. Classic Disney for the 90s. The Shaggy Dog. Mad Dog. Mad Dog. Then, Melanie Griffiths, Michael Douglas, and Liam Neeson. The stirring World War II drama shining through tonight. 328 remaining in the third quarter. Lamley had a punt blocked earlier in the game, and he came very close to having this one blocked by Alvin Walton coming up the middle. One of the problems that Wayne Lamley has is that he's a three-stride kicker. He saw the pressure coming right up against the middle. He tried to pull off a little bit on that, and he shanked it, and he gives Baltimore great field position, Don, out at midfield. CFLers are first and 10 from their own 54. Lobs it over the middle. Tui Palutu with a great catch along the sideline. Don, once again, as we talked about many times tonight, when Tracy Ham gets this lock one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker and a running back, he's going to take advantage. Watch Don Moni. Never sees the ball. He never gets a chance to turn around. All he is doing is chasing Tui Palutu makes a great open field reception right there. Tremendous effort by Tui Pelotu. What a great pass by Ham, but great play by Tui Pelotu. First and 10, Baltimore from the, Winnem or from the Toronto 33-yard line, and it's driven! Touchdown! Don Matt 
Matthews was saying that he is the fastest man on the team, and when he got into open field, nobody was going to catch Robert Drummond. Well, I spoke earlier in this quarter about the amount of time that both the Toronto defense has spent on the field. You can see right now it's evident that the defense is tired for the Argonauts. A simple off-tackle play, no linebacker support in the hole. Robert Drummond hit an untouched, walked into the end zone for the touchdown. In his career, two rushing touchdowns, and they couldn't become at a more opportune time for Baltimore. In this semifinal game against Toronto, Dominique Waibike has the point after. Baltimore has moved into a 17-point lead. Well, a 17-point lead, Don, an almost unsurmountable lead, the way this offense has been playing for Baltimore. Tracy Ham has had a masterful game plan that he's been able to execute thus far. Watch to the right. As Earl comes around and kicks out on Campbell, Don Moe cannot come inside. Tui Pelotu, the fullback, holds him off man for man, just outmans him. Drummond waltzes into the end zone. Get a great shot here. The kick out by Earl on Campbell, the trap. Right there, Don Moe could not close down inside. Drummond untouched into the end zone. NFL experience with Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Denver before signing as a free agent with Baltimore on the 4th of August. And what a replacement he has proven to be today for the record-setting CFL rusher Mike Pringle. Drummond has 97 rushing yards and 50 more as a pass receiver. Well, he's a bigger and faster back than Mike Pringle. Everyone was very concerned about Mike Pringle not being in the lineup. If Baltimore continues on next week and Mike Pringle is healthy enough, he will be back in the lineup. But Drummond tonight has done a mass wonderful job in taking control of the running game for Baltimore. Pinball Clemens is the man bringing it back for the Argos. He stays on his feet coming up the sidelines, and this will be the best field position in some time that Marvin Graves has been operating from in a first down situation. Scott? Don, I'm just behind the Argonaut bench, and needless to say, this was not the way that Bob Obilovich was hoping the second half would go. At halftime, he spoke to his players about how the wind went out of their sails on the block punt by Wayne Lamley, asked them to raise their level of intensity to what it was before that, because he said prior to that block punt, he felt they were playing uh, down for down with uh, the Baltimore CFLers, and now it'll be a struggle with Baltimore in front by 17. And by the way, starting center Blaine Schmidt is out of this game with a concussion. And that means Pierre Bercheval has shifted to the center position. The pass is complete to Paul Masati. He lunges forward, trying to pick up a first down and will be close. Don right here with Bercheval moving into the center. Smith moving in, or Smith out with the concussion. That's going to be an adjustment because he hasn't taken many snaps, and you have to have that rhythm sequence. Great reception that time by Gordon on the play to pick up the first down. But Pierre Vercheval is a very muscular offensive lineman. And so it's not a fluid motion for him to be snapping the ball back to the rookie quarterback, Marvin Graves. And they haven't worked at all this year together. The Western Ontario grad spent five years with Edmonton. And he began his Toronto career as a center. So he's not unfamiliar with the position. But that, moves, that means that uh, Francois Belanger comes into the line lineup with uh, Bercheval shifting into the center position 35,223 watching this playoff game at Memorial Stadium Don when you think about Marvin Graves that we get to look since the first quarter he has only amassed 42 yards passing since that tremendous first quarter when the Argonauts put 10 points on the scoreboard this is what you might call a freebie for Marvin Graves, although he is going to keep. He dives forward, will have the first down, but there's a penalty called on the play. Normally you'll get that in the offside situation. You get Robert, another look at Robert Drummond here on the bench, looking for another opportunity. Two plays, 56 yards, a 33-yard dash for the touchdown. That'll get you an end zone in a hurry. But he had an earlier dash to the end zone, a 42-yarder with a great straight arm along the way on Reggie Pleasant, called back by a penalty. Tremendous move by Robert Drummond. Showed, he showed great athletic ability tonight in this game. And so this Baltimore team is very deep at the running back position, and it's proved their worth tonight. The penalty call against Baltimore gives Toronto a first down. Graves is now throwing for Irwin. He's got a touchdown. 
He was bumped down at the goal line by Carl Anthony. There were two flags, one with the initial contact and then one that came late. Don, that was a move way beyond Dale Irwin's years because he slowed down to allow Carl Anthony to make the contact, and when he did, he exploded away from the contact, made the reception for the 34-yard touchdown pass from Marvin Graves. The Argonauts could be right back in this game. They get this call. But Coach Obilovich anticipating the call right here, feeling a little unnervy. Everyone in the stadium saw it. Obilovich is wondering what is taking the officials so much time to make the call that everyone recognized. Might there be a dispute that one official saw it one way, well, the other saw it another way? Well, when you're standing behind a defensive back, you're allowed to slow down. When he ran into him, the defensive back initiated the contact. Irwin, like I said, a play well beyond his years. They're calling interference both ways. I believe that's going to be the call. And Bob Obilovich can't believe it. I don't blame him. I would be beside myself if I was the Toronto head coach. If we can get another look at this on replay, Irwin had all the right to his face on the field. That was a bad call by the official. Four shots in the third. Baltimore number nine. Separate inter incident, four pass interference, Toronto 83, a redo the down. There's no way that they could call pass interference on Irwin on that play. Dave Irwin was behind the secondary. We'll get a great look. He slows down, waiting on the ball. Anthony runs up his back. You're allowed to at that spot on the field when you're a receiver. That's a blown call by the official. Wow. Marvin Graves comes right back with the pass to Clemens, and this will be close to another first down. It looked as though Irwin was clearly in behind the defender, Charles Anthony. It didn't appear as though he made any contact with Anthony, but they called interference both ways, and it was a, a late flag after Irwin got into the end zone that produced the penalty call. Well, this is a safe pass for Graves to pick up yardage on the second down situation to give him a third and short and the Argos are going to be forced to go for it here. Second and three for Toronto. Handoff to Shamsit Dean and he will be close but I don't think he's got it. However, I don't think there's any doubt either that Graves as he looks to the bench will be trying to pick up the first down. Don, they're going to have to go for it here in the third and short situation as time is running out here in the third quarter. Miller comes into the ball game as Alvin Walton comes out for Baltimore in a defensive role. Third and one for the Argos. This looks like the final play of the third quarter. John Dean bursts through to pick up the Toronto first down. He will keep the drive alive. And that is also the final play of quarter three with Baltimore leading Toronto 27-10. Not many cars can offer you a quote like this. Fewer still, a quote like this. But only one car can give you a quote like this. The new 1995 Maxima from Nissan. Experience the S.O. Tiger, spirit of service. The service is number one, and then the, the details just top it off. We take what we do very seriously. We expect to be the best, and we, we work at it. Quality, friendly service. And I think that's what it all comes down to. We reserve bed and breakfast for 25 homes downtown Toronto, so we really depend on our long distance. 
great service. Rates are the same as anybody else out there, if not better. Every day, more and more businesses are switching back to Bell. When you called them, they were there all the time, especially on repairs. So give us a call, and we'll prove that we can give your business an advantage. Bell Advantage. Bell has been great for us. We're happy to be back with them. Bell, what took you so long? <laughs> The CFL on CBC. Brought to you by Bell Canada. Bob Obilovich was really upset with what appeared to be Dave Irwin's first ever professional touchdown. It was negated by a double interference call. Don, he had a legitimate complaint. Dave Irwin was behind Carl Anthony, slowed down to wait on the ball. That's what a receiver does, adjust when the ball is in flight. Anthony ran up his back, made the contact. The official threw the flag, said that Irwin interfered with Anthony. I don't know how he could see that any different, and he was standing right there, and the play was right in front of him. The biggest play of the season for the Argonauts, whether they go in and score or not now, it took all their momentum away from them. To start the fourth quarter, it's first and 10 Toronto. The ball is at the 22. Graves drills the pass to Irwin. He has confidence in this young man as he takes it down to the 10-yard line. He made his Argo debut last week against Winnipeg. He caught four passes for 47 yards. He was shaken up early in this game, but has bounced back. And he has shown the poise at times in running his pattern of a veteran. Well, he did, and the great adjustment that he made on the non-touchdown call, but right there, found the open spot in the soft spot of the zone, went down, broke it off, came back to his quarterback, got the separation. Graves rewarded him with a perfect strike. First and goal, Toronto. There's the toss to the pinball, and he can't get outside. Matt Goodwin, with tremendous speed, came over to make the initial contact. You have to be totally impressed with Matt Goodwin as a football player. The young man has filled that position in middle linebacker tonight for Baltimore admirably. Started out as a defensive back we spoke about, but watch the pursuit as he flows along with pinball Clemens. Pinball is his man on the pitch, lowers the shoulders, makes the contact, drives Mike out of bounds. Argonaut lose four on the play. It will be second and goal from the 14. You talk about being impressed with Goodwin. I know you have been all year. You selected him as your rookie of the year candidate before the first ballot votes were even announced. Bobby Gordon in the corner of the end zone can't catch up with it. He was being covered by Ken Watson. Well, the crowd has got into this game here versus Argonauts, and they're going to be forced to go for a field goal. But once again, Matt Goodwin on that delayed blitz from his middle linebacker position up in the face of a Marvin Graves, forcing him to throw the ball early, early before Gordon could break free in the back of the end zone. Argonauts have to settle for a Wayne Lamley field goal attempt. And, Don, this is no sure thing. It will be a 21-yarder for Wayne Lamley. He opened the scoring with a 38-yard kick. And he puts this one through. So with 13-21 remaining in the football game, it's now 27-13, Baltimore leading Toronto. Can we afford not to? What night? They will take visa there, won't they? Of course! And how will you be paying, sir? Visa. Accepted in twice as many places as American Express. Visa. It's the only card you need. Green. Go. Now, this is a new thing. I don't know if you're aware of it. Lots of people going through the greens now. Watch it as a woman. It says yield there, Jim. What, what, what didn't you understand in there? I don't want to tell you to drive, but you should, you should have went left. Guy in a bike. Guy in a bike. Well, what is this driving all of a sudden? Slow it, Jim, please. Hey, not watch it. Park car! Actual footage of a Pontiac Grand Am driver as a passenger. You're killing me. Pontiac Grand Am. Built for drivers. In an increasingly complex world, 
We cut through the clutter. CBC News World. Immediate. Accessible. First. Find this symbol in your TV listings and stick with it. CBC News World. Canada's news and information network. 24 hours a day. We go the distance to bring you a Canadian view of the world. CBC News World. News on the hour. Information around the clock. At Memorial Stadium, 13-21 to go in this game. It's 27-13 Baltimore in Edmonton. 2016 BC now. Sean Fleming missed a field goal. The Eskimos got a single. 12-22 left in that West Division semifinal at Commonwealth. Here's Mike Pringle, who's here to say looks like he'll get another chance to uh, play next week in the East Division final, and you will play. Oh, 100%. I I'm going. Um, you couldn't keep me out of that game. What do you think of the way Drummond's played so far today? Oh, he's done an excellent job out there. He's um, did a lot of good things for him, and um, you know, I'm just happy that um, you know the offense is clicking. Mike, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. And it's Drummond carrying the ball again. And Rodney Harding is the man who came across to make the tackle. But Drummond seems to be picking up confidence with each carry. He seems to be running harder. He may have been a little tentative earlier in the ballgame. Well, the confidence that he's picking up, Don, is coming from the exploits of his offensive line, the field blocking that they've been able to do. You saw Calvin Tigo come across, get that initial penetration, but they had sealed off the rest of the Argonaut defense, and Tigo had him pinned in the backfield, but he had no support from his supporting cast. Drummond was able to pick up a first down. 17 carries now for 106 yards for Drummond. Three receivers line up wide to the right. Handoff goes to Drummond again. And he gets the ball to the 50-yard line. Stopped there by Swift Birch. 6'3", 215 pounds. And he has run a 100-meter 10-3. Well, this time he had a Calvin Tigo sitting up in the hole, getting an arm on the leg. But Drummond has proved that you just can't bring him down with one arm. He slowed him enough to get some help from his teammates. But Calvin Tigo can't make all the stops on his own tonight. Ten three times are what you associate with a namesake, John Drummond, a sprinter on the U.S. Olympic team. Walter Wilson is the man that uh, Tracy Ham attempted to go to. A good inside position by Reggie Pleasant, the all-time Argo interception leader, 47 in his career with Toronto. Well, we'll see right here as the Argonauts have just not been able to put any pressure on Tracy Ham. Calvin Tigo, along with Namaco, blitzing from his free safety, just couldn't get there, and Ham got it away. Great coverage downfield, though, by Reggie Pleasant, inside position, not allowing Wilson to work inside. Miller has outkicked Wayne Lamley so far this afternoon or this evening, wherever you're looking in. It's dark. <laughs> Yeah, but it gets dark a lot earlier than it did the last time these two teams met. Penalty flag as Clemens tries to go to the outside. And then he and Washington are forced to do some hurtling, a five-yard return after a 40-yard kick. So once again, specialty teams are a problem for the Argonaut. They're going to be flagged for an illegal block here, and they're going to lose yardage on the play in poor field position once again for Marvin Gray's in the offense to start Illegal a drive. Block. Toronto 21. 10 yard penalty. First down. George Namaco is charged with the illegal block. Well, you'll see it right here as Namaco flies right into your screen and takes out Peter Toy Palutu, the fullback coming down covering for Baltimore. And the Argos have the ball at the 10-yard line. 100 yards of pay dirt in front of them if they're going to score. And the clock is their enemy with 11.07 remaining in the fourth quarter. Excellent catch by Paul Masati up at the 32-yard line. And that play almost never got untracked as Graves, in trying to set up, slipped. It's been a problem all night long, Don, but Paul Mazzotti, he knows how to read a defense. He recognized where the Baltimore defenders are not. Goodwin could not get back in the underneath coverage, the two-deep zone. Found the soft spot. Graves with the good throw. Mazzotti with the great catch. First and 10, Toronto. They are at their own 33-yard line. 
Bounce pass intended for Paul Masati. Good job by the Toronto offensive line in picking up rush end Alver Alfred Payton. Well, you see Marvin Gray's numbers tonight versus Tracy Ham. He's gotten on track again here late in the second half. He had no yards passing in the second quarter, which Toronto faltered in, and Baltimore was able to score 17 points to get this big lead tonight. Second and 10. Again intended for Masati. He tried to go up high to bring it down, but he was unable to make the catch, and that forces the Argos to kick it away. Carl Anthony likes to play a lot of bump and run. He gets up in the face of Paul Mazzotti. When he releases him inside, he got inside help from Michael Brooks. The free safety, the ball was high. Argonauts once again forced the punt. High punt by Lamley. Lester Smith flips if he makes the catch, and he won't go any further than the 47-yard line pinned there by Leon Hatziano with 9.46 remaining in the game. Coburg. Arnold's Cove. No matter where you are. Plaster Rock. Fox Creek. No matter where you live. You're never far from home. Home hardware. With 900 dealers coast to coast. There's a home in every neighborhood. With lots of friendly advice. 900 dealer buying power guarantees a great price. We buy big, you save big. You can count on us. After all, what are neighbors for? Great price, friendly advice at home hardware. Water Spring manufactures uh, mattresses and we export them all over the world. Long distance is a must with us. It has to be done right. And we get that with Bell. Every day, more and more businesses are switching back to Bell. They came and they understood our business. They found out what we needed. Old Ma Bell's gotten a lot younger. So give us a call, and we'll prove that we can give your business a real advantage. Bell advantage. I'm not talking to a voice on the other end of the phone. I'm talking to a person. Price is important, but if the system doesn't work, it doesn't matter much about the price. In the midst of the Depression. It's the story of the century. A miracle. Black baby. It's on my own eyes. But from hope. It's a fairy tale that doesn't ever need to end with. Came greed. Get out now! Abused. How dare you suggest? Ah! Celine Bonnier, Roy Dupuis, Beau Bridges, Kate Nelligan. The true story of Izzy and Nelly Vadia, never before written about the Give us back our kids. Million Dollar Babies begins November 20th. Brought to you by Canadian Dairy Products. It's the CFLers by 14 here in Baltimore, 946 away from a berth in the East Division Final at Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonds, and the Eskimos were trailing with less than 10 minutes to go when Damon Allen hooked up with downtown Eddie Brown. This was Allen at his scrambling best. Look what he does with this broken play. Finds Eddie Brown wide open. We saw some of this in the first half. This play went 75 yards for the touchdown, and it's the biggest play of the game for the Eskimos, who've gone ahead 23-21 with nine minutes to go, Don. And here Robert Drummond on first down picks up about two as he takes it up to the 50-yard line. Don Moan and Keith Costello came over to make the tackle, and we've got 9.23 remaining at Memorial Stadium. Don, now what the Argonauts need to do, they need to have someone come up with a big piece of the play. Not just to stop, they need a, a play that will change momentum right now. If not a turnover, maybe someone with a smashing hit to get players fired up and back into this ball game. And if there's anyone capable of a smashing hit, he wears number 73 for the Argos, Calvin Tiggle. The big haul. Tracy Ham goes down with Rodney Harding and Calvin Tiggle coming up the middle. You called it, Don. Calvin Tiggle. When they need a big play, a big hit, He's been Mr. Consistency all season long for the Toronto Argonauts. He's the leader of the pack. He comes on a blitz. Nick Subas, the center, can't handle him. He comes right through him. Rodney Harding also there, who will get credit for the sack. But Calvin Teagle made that play. The Argonauts needed it. He delivered. Almost appeared as though a face mask call could have been charged against Baltimore as Subas got his hand up into the throat area of Teagle. They got in a few breaks tonight. <laughs> Well, the Argos needed a two-and out, and now they need a punt return by Mike Pinball Clemens. Stan Petrie was inside the five-yard area. And Mike Clemens goes down at the 30-yard line. 
Clemens was pushed out of bounds by Ken Benson. Well, wherever you're looking in on the CBC network this evening, we hope you're enjoying the action from Memorial Stadium and will be with us tomorrow afternoon for the other half of the Eastern semifinal playoff round. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers at home to Ottawa. The telecast begins at 3 o'clock Eastern time. And Don, with Matt, help, Matt Dunnigan healthy once again, Winnipeg's offense has been clicking on all cylinders. And the other semifinal at McMahon Stadium in Calgary also begins at 3 Eastern time. That's Saskatchewan at Calgary, and that game will be seen on the CBC Western Network. And what can you say about that high-powered Calgary offense? A record-setting season for them all year long. Doug Flutie, Alan Pitts, Tony Stewart, a formidable task for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. But they're playing a Saskatchewan team, I should caution, that has played pretty well in the last half of the season. Coach Ray Yock has to get a lot of consideration for CFL Coach of the Year. First and 10 from the 37. Graves is in trouble. He got away from Peyton. Now Brigance is after him. A key block by Joe Burgos, who came back to take down Alfred Peyton. Peyton and Burgos at the 25-yard line are still nose-to-nose -nose having discussions about that hit. Peyton thought he had Graves all lined up when Burgos came back to cut him down. Well, defensive linemen don't take kindly to offensive linemen peeling back, getting those crackback blocks on him, but Joe Burgos was protecting his quarterback, Marvin Graves, who shows that he's very nimble of foot, avoiding the rush. Burgos peels back, takes Peyton out, allows Graves to stay alive. Through the football downfield, incomplete. There's a bad snap. The exchange from center, and that's the problem that Bercheval may be having coming into the ball game as a replacement at center for the injured Blaine Schmidt. Spoke about the muscularity of a Pierre Bercheval who would have problems snapping the ball. That time it was very evident. Couldn't get the arm back through the legs cleanly. He has a very muscular upper body. He's not as flexible as Smith is the, the normal center, and it was evident. Third down kick taken by Lester Smith. Pretty good hitting on special teams as Smith brings it back to the 47-yard line with 724 remaining. The challenge. Take the popular Toyota Tercel and reshape it, re-engineer it, make it better. So we developed a new, more powerful 16-valve engine that delivers improved fuel economy, a sleeker design, and a more ergonomic interior. Presenting the totally redesigned Toyota Tercel. Take one for a spin. Cool. Tercel. It's more than just a fun new car. If it can kill a, a bug, then it's going to be harmful to humans. Your next trip may make you sick. It's poison. Spraying humans to kill bugs. It should be banned. Health risk or necessary evil. It's got a lot of damage. Marketplace, Tuesday at 7.30. They look new. They look like the parts. They're broken. How safe are our airplanes? There are enough parts in those scrapyards to build a complete engine. An illegal industry that's costing lives. Isn't this dangerous? Of course it is. Counterfeit parts on the 5th Estate, Tuesday at 8. Will always be my special angel. A loving father. It's my dad. A small child. What about your dad? I did nothing to kill him. I'm gonna get him. Your dad? Gilbert Jonathan Farrell. Yes. Big fat ugly liar. Both of you! I didn't lie, Mom. Is it your sister who is lying or is it your father? Kate Nelligan, Art Hindle, Vanessa King. What have you done to this family now? Liar Liar, Sunday night at 8 on CBC. If the only mouse you've ever heard of has four legs and a passion for cheese, then get ready. The big computer companies are after you. Robert Scully takes a look at the exploding home computer market. Venture right after Sunday reports. Will be! Saturday. Classic Disney for the 90s. The Shaggy Dog. Mad Dog. Mad Dog. Then, Melanie Griffith, Michael Douglas, and Liam Neeson. The stirring World War II drama shining through tonight. Armstrong scored a first half touchdown. Robert Drummond has scored a touchdown in both the first half and the second half. And with time winding down and ball control so important for Baltimore, I think we're going to see number two lugging the football a fair bit over the final seven minutes and 24 seconds. Don, when Robert Drummond, 
Drummond became effective running the ball. Chris Armstrong had backed the linebackers off from the line of scrimmage. Now Robert Drummond has the linebackers prepped close back to the line of scrimmage. I wouldn't be too surprised to see Tracy Ham go back to his aerial assault with some underneath pass routes. Tui Pelotu comes out of the backfield, and there's also a penalty flag, and this could be a late hit on Tracy Ham by Rodney Harding. Rodney Harding showing frustration came through and hit quarterback Tracy Ham, former teammates last year in Toronto. Toronto 77, 15 yards, first down. Ten years in the Canadian Football League with the Toronto Argonauts. And this is a costly penalty. Very costly penalty. Tracy Ham had gotten the ball away cleanly. Rodney Harding came through. Referee Dave Yule right on top. You got to protect the quarterback. And he made a good call. First and 10, Baltimore from the Toronto 41. Tracy Ham using as much of the 22nd clock as possible before calling the play and giving to Drummond. Drummond slipped as he tried to cut but will still roll for about three. Now by Rodney Harding and Quick He slipped on the run, but right now Baltimore is in complete control of this ball game. You can see the frustration on the Argonaut players. They, they don't have much giddy up in their step right now. They're just mauling around as they're moving back and forth. And Baltimore, as you said, with Tracy Ham. He, he's, a, he's a general when he's in his position on the field because he'll utilize all the time in all of his players. Second and seven. There's that underneath pass you referred to to Chris Armstrong. And a big first down for Baltimore. Don, it was just a matter of time. You could see it being set up. Tracy Ham has worked his game plan masterfully tonight. When he had the run going, he knew that the linebackers had to creep up. The minute he got the linebackers close again, he knew that Chris Arm would be Chris Armstrong would be open underneath. You see no linebacker in the underneath coverage. They're trying to chase it down. Castello is coming into the picture, but it's way late. The only thing back there is the back half of that secondary and they can't get the coverage job done. A gain of 24, the first catch in the second half for Chris Armstrong, his fourth of the game. Hand off to Drummond. He had a little problem getting on track, and that enables three Argos to come over and drop him for a loss, and there is also a penalty flag in the vicinity of the 10-yard line. Normally in that position where you'll get a holding call against Baltimore, and it may give Toronto a little bit of a reprieve right here on this play. Costello turn Drummond in as he was able as he was trying to turn the corner but Baltimore the penalty is declined second down with the loss in the play the penalty is declined as Baltimore is backed up to the 16 yard line it will be second and 14 Don Tracy Ham at this point he will be looking in zone he wants to put this one away once and for all this is the point on the game where he can do it. And what are the chances he'll throw to 81? Touchdown! You know, you said, what were the chances of going to 81? If I was a betting man, I would have taken you up on that. <laughs> The second touchdown of the game for Chris Armstrong, a 16-yard touchdown reception. And that should pretty much do it for the Baltimore CFLers. 5-11 remaining in the game. Don, you could see it in Tracy Ham's play calling. He was so methodical in his execution. He would set up the run by the pass, the pass via the run. And it was all about manipulating the linebackers of the Argonauts. As he would get them out of position, he would exploit the area where he knew that they would not be. As you saw Robin Drummond running, the linebackers were forced to stay close to the line of scrimmage. Chris Armstrong on that last play was able to get off of the line of scrimmage. They didn't get a jam on him, and so when you don't get a jam, he ran the up and out route. You'll see him right, he comes off freely. Can't run with him, Thomas, as he takes him up. 
per Tracy Ham throws a perfect strike. Touchdown, Baltimore. And what a success story this has been. It bears repeating. Chris Armstrong, released by Las Vegas, contacted Tracy Ham. Ham spoke with Don Matthews and said that it would be worthwhile taking a look at Chris Armstrong. Matthews said if he can still run, we'll give him a shot. He came in, ran a 4-4, and the rest goes into the record books. 18 receptions for touchdowns during the regular season. And Robert Drummond has done it all tonight. Pass catching, running, and right there we just saw the key block for his quarterback, Tracy Ham, to get the ball to the slot back, Chris Armstrong. To take that story even further, Don, when you think about Tracy Ham, Mike Pringle, Chris Armstrong, these three players were the nucleus of the 1990 Edmonton Eskimo offense. Now they're here carrying Baltimore to the second round of the CFL playoffs next week versus either Winnipeg or Ottawa. Let's go down to the sideline to Scott Oates. All right, James, it's nail-biting time for the Grey Cup champion Eskimos in Edmonton. The Eskimos driving for the insurance points against the BC Lions in their West Division semifinal. Look at this from the four-yard line. Damon Allen intercepted by Charles Gordon. He returned it to midfield. And so the Lions have new life in the semifinal. Still 23-21 Eskimos with uh, under four minutes to go in regulation time. And just over four minutes to go in regulation time here at Memorial Stadium. First and 10, Marvin Graves standing back at his own 38, and he drills one complete to Gordon for a first down or close to it at the midfield strike. Well, they're not going to give him the spot on it. A good play, pass play, though, by Marvin Graves on first down, but now he needs to stay in his hurry-up offense, and he needs to pick up the first down. They're going to give it to him now. He needs to throw those safe passes. Bad snap again. Graves is able to pull it down over the middle again to Gordon. And this time he has seven yards on the pass completion. Well, Marvin Graves, he's working against a soft Baltimore defense right now. They're willing to give up some underneath passes. They want to protect. They're playing a two-deep zone secondary right now, not allowing anyone deep over the middle. Graves was looking for Clemens, couldn't get it to him. I made a comment earlier, James, and I'll say it again. When the Argos had some momentum in the first half with the Keith Costello interception, they couldn't move the ball. They had a punt blocked. When they stopped Baltimore in the third quarter on a third down gamble on the Baltimore side of midfield, they couldn't get anything out of that. Those could be two very key plays, turnovers that they were unable to capitalize on that might have made the difference in this game. Well, Don, I'll still stick with my biggest play of the game. The interference call against Toronto when it didn't look like it was an interference when the receiver had Irwin had all the right in the world to the ball because he was behind the secondary. Anthony ran up his back and he was flagged for interference for just playing the football. Pinball provides Toronto with a first down, making a sideline reception at the 44. 311 is the time remaining. 34-13, Baltimore leads. Graves looking for it all as he went down the sidelines intended for Masadi. And Masadi was being covered by Carl Anthony. 2.50 is the time remaining. We'll be back with the Toronto second down play after this. With his back to the camera in his 17th season as a CFL coach. And it looks as though he's going to keep alive his dream of acquiring a seventh Grey Cup ring. In this semifinal game against Toronto, his team leads 34-13 with 2.50 remaining. Matthews won six Grey Cup championships, five as defensive coordinator in Edmonton, and one as the head coach of the BC Lions. Graves was looking to dump it off to the pinball, who was being covered by Tracy Gravely over the middle. Well, Argonauts here running out of chances to have an opportunity to come back in this game. 
third and ten where Marvin Graves went on first down where he went for it all, put himself in a tough situation because Baltimore knows that he has to throw on every down and it allows you to blitz on second and ten. And they came after him, they're going to come after him once again on third and ten. Here comes the pressure. Graves throws to the sidelines, and Paul Masati, his most reliable receiver, takes it out of bounds, close to a first down. Forced out by Carl Anthony. Well, that was a very tough spot that time by the officials, and Coach Obilovich is complaining. Watch Paul Masati as he works out of bounds. See the yardstick. Watch where he steps out of bounds at, and watch where they give him the spot. He is driven back by Carl Anthony. You have to give him the spot where his forward progress stops. Fortunately enough, the Argonauts keep the drive alive and get the first down. 2.31 remaining. 34-13. Baltimore leads Toronto. Baltimore victory. will send them against either Winnipeg or Ottawa next weekend in the Eastern Final. They could play in Winnipeg if the Bombers prevail tomorrow, or they could be here at home if Ottawa wins. Graves running all over the field, but he can't escape Alfred Payton. The football comes loose. It's picked up by Brigance, but the whistle had already gone. Marvin Graves did all he could, Don, on that particular play in trying to stay alive, but the relentless pursuit of this Baltimore defense that has just become more and more aggressive as this game has waned on. It's just been wearing down this Argonaut offensive front and getting closer and closer to Marvin Graves, and that time they captured their trophy. Penalty flags fly prior to the ball being snapped. Second and 29, Toronto. It's a, proce a procedure call against the Argos. Hey, Alfred Payton would probably say, I knew if I stayed in one place long enough, Graves would eventually come back to me. Well, he <laughs> ran all over the field. Marvin Graves had to run at least 50 yards on that play because Miller was the first one to get a shot at him as he came through cleanly. Scott Miller was rotating into that defensive line along with Gerald Bayless and Robert Pressberry, and Bayless is out of the game at the moment. He came off the field with a slight limp. He should be okay for next week's ball game, but there's Illegal a precautionary measure. Toronto 67. The yardage is declined. The clock will run on the whistle. Declining the penalty. Baltimore has the advantage of the clock starting on the whistle rather than when the ball is snapped. Intended for Masadi again on the sidelines. 157 remaining in the game. Scott? All right, Tom. Well, how big did Damon Allen's interception turn out to be late in this game in Edmonton? Eskimos and BC Lions in the West semifinal. Lou Pasaglia, 27 yards out, makes the field goal, and he makes it 24-23 BC, and it's now final. We have confirmation the game is just over. The Grey Cup champion Edmonton Eskimos are out in the first round of the playoffs. And no team has successfully defended a Grey Cup since the Eskimos put together that string of five in a row. So the defending champions are gone. 1982 was the last time that there was a repeat as a Grey Cup champion. And that will stay intact with that great Edmonton Eskimo team. Bobby Gordon was onside. And I don't think the officials recognized that he was onside because they all threw a flag. Well, I think they had to throw the flag with Gordon grabbing the ball. And now I'm sure they'll sort it out as Matt Goodwin is moved away from the altercation. Well, Toronto came up earlier on the short end of a critical call when Irwin thought that he had a touchdown along with Coach Obilovich. Now with Bobby Gordon, a very handsy call by Coach Obilovich, putting Gordon onside. Graves with the quick kick. Gordon going down, recovering. Bilovich waiting for this conference to determine his team's fate. He didn't like the outcome of the previous one that denied him a touchdown by Dave Irwin. We have no flag on the play. Number 84 was onside. Toronto first down. Great call by Dave Yu, the head official here tonight in Baltimore, of recognizing that Gordon was onside on the kick. Great maneuver by Coach Obilovich, 
still coaching the game. It takes 60 minutes to play a football game. He's in it all the way. Well, Belovich might, uh, might have liked the call. I don't think Matthews did. <laughs> What's adversary mean? <laughs> First and 10, Toronto from the 24 of Baltimore. Graves looks to the end zone. This is intercepted by Michael Brooks. He tosses it off to Irvin Smith, and he slips and goes down at the 11-yard line. Graves thought he had the receiver open in the end zone, but Michael Brooks, playing the free safety spot, came over to intercept, and with 120 remaining, that will do it. Laying in the weeds, Don. Michael Brooks, as we said earlier, the composure of Marvin Graves, how would he handle the pressure? That time he gambled. He wanted it all on first down. Sometimes you have to take what they give you, and that's the underneath route. And that time he went deep. Graves came over from free safety. Big turnover once again, Baltimore. The Argos will charter home immediately following the game. Bob Obilovich, I think, has this Toronto team on the right track with the players he's added to the roster in the last part of the season. Tracy Ham, chased by Joe Sardo and downed at the 11 yard line. Well, they've done wholesale substitutions. You see Don Moan on the sideline, Paul Clantney, Joe Sardo in at outside linebackers. Don Moan, 13 illustrious career, 13 illustrious years as an outside linebacker for the Toronto Argonauts, set an Ironman record for them, consecutive games played. Played in two Grey Cup championships as a member of the Argonauts, 1983, 1991. You remember that 83 game, don't you? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> hey, first Grey Cup game ever played in a dome stadium, Don. Drummond is... You called it too, did you? I did. Dropped for a loss with 46 seconds. Remaining. Now, go a step further. Did you call the first one played outside? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're, you'd really be stretching there. <laughs> the timeout has been called by the Argos with 46 seconds remaining. Now, Don Matthews has to wait for the outcome of tomorrow's game at Winnipeg Stadium. If the Bombers win, his team will travel to Winnipeg next Sunday in the Eastern Final. Who do you think he'll be cheering for tomorrow? I honestly do <laughs> believe that he'll be cheering for one, one of his former assistant coaches, Adam Rita, because he would love to get the Eastern Final here in Baltimore, but I don't know if that feat will occur because that's a tall tree to climb when you're playing the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and you're playing there in their home, in their house. That's the place where they don't lose too often, and with a healthy Matt Dunnigan once again, they got a very tenacious defense out there led by Robert Clark at linebacker. They'll have their hands full, the Ottawa Rough Riders will tomorrow in Winnipeg. Tracy Ham is going to go back into the end zone and he's going to run around, take some time off the clock, but he's quite willing to concede the safety touch. 35 seconds, the time remaining. And around the five-yard line, there was some additional pushing and shoving, but it doesn't appear as though anything more serious is going to develop, although a couple of players want to get involved, and one of them is the biggest man on the field, Neil Fork, along with Swift Birch. Fork is listed as being 335 pounds. I don't know whether that's the guy I'd want to tangle with if I was Swift Birch. Well, it, Swift might be the best thing in that situation because <laughs> if he could get away from him, <laughs> it'd be an asset for him. But Tracy Ham with a very handsy play and smart call by coach Don Matthews. Run some extra time off of the play clock. Just move around, punt the, kick the ball for field position. That's what they're doing in this situation. They'll give up the two points, They'll be kicking the ball off from the 35-yard line, knowing that the Argonauts don't have a chance of pulling this one out, but they want to limit any opportunity that the Argonauts may have of even scoring a touchdown. So it's now 34-15 with 35 seconds remaining. Jim Sparrows and his Baltimore team 
We're on cloud nine after knocking off Winnipeg 57-10 here at Memorial Stadium in the second last week of the season. It looked as though they were going to finish in first place, and then they went to Sacramento last weekend and were shut out. 18-0 by the Gold Miners. Well, not since 1988 has an Eastern Conference sim uh, second place team gone to the Grey Cup winning the game on the road. And that was the Winnipeg Blue Bombers versus the Toronto Argonauts. Now, Baltimore will be faced with that task. If Winnipeg can win tomorrow at home versus Ottawa, they will have the opportunity to be become the second team since 1988 to accomplish that feat. Asadi has taken out of bounds about a yard shy of a first down. Well, this one was off the hands of Matt Goodwin, off the fingertips of Paul Masadi, and it falls harmlessly to the turf. It will be third and a yard with 24 seconds remaining. You know, Toronto can feel proud about what they've accomplished in making the playoffs. It's not since they had won the Grey Cup had they been in the playoffs. And they did it with a team that had a lot of turmoil early in the season. Toto Bilovich stuck with some key personnel. They came through in the end. They built a solid foundation around young quarterback Marvin Graves. And they made the playoffs. And they'll have a lot to build on in season to come. Is there anyone who, well, he doesn't really go to any extremes, but he has one of the most unusual fact dances of any player in the league. Hey, but you got to make hits like this. Alfred Payton planting a former de teammate, Dwayne Ford. They were together in Winnipeg together on that breakup team. Alfred Payton was very happy to come over here to Baltimore after things didn't work out for him in Shreveport. He went there as a free agent. They had a defensive scheme that was not suited for Alfred Payton, sort of like Tracy Ham last year in Toronto. Once the de he came to Baltimore, they felt that their defense was complete. He was the missing link, and they've been a solid force ever since. He had 22 sacks last year in Winnipeg and was runner-up to teammate Gerald Bayless as the outstanding defensive player in the CFL. 18 seconds on the clock as Tracy Ham takes the knee, and now he'll be able to take the final seconds off the clock and send the Baltimore CFLers to the dressing room with a 34-15 win and a berth in the Eastern Final next Sunday against either Winnipeg or Ottawa. Don, this has to be one of the sweetest victories in the career of Tracy Ham after being maligned all last season in Toronto, blamed for all the mishaps and mistakes that team made, the non-successful season, and to come here with the CFL as in their inaugural CFL season to turn it round, to win second place in the Eastern Conference, to get a home playoff team, and to win it in such commanding fashion, 34-15 to 15, over the Argonauts. You have to really feel for Tracy Ham, Don Matthews, and the rest of the Baltimore organization. So Baltimore will now await the outcome of tomorrow's semifinal game to determine whether or not they will be at home or on the road next time. Go. Scott. All right, Don, I'm with Don Matthews, the victorious head coach today. Don, uh, yesterday you didn't really want to comment on what you thought uh, Robert Drummond might do in Mike Pringle's place, uh, but now you've seen him play, what would you say? Well, we didn't change our game plan. You know, uh, Robert Drummond's a good football player. We have good football players, good depth, so... Uh, you know, when he went in the game, we just stayed with our regular game. Tracy Ham just keeps on doing it for you. Yeah, Tracy's a pretty special football player, and, you know, he's been in the league a long time, and so in games like this, he just comes up to the occasion. You've said before, Don, you'll never be a first-year team again. Does that make this something special to be in the East Final now? Well, it really does. You know, I think this team is good enough to play for championships down the road, but it'll never play for a championship as a first-year team, so that really makes it special. Chances are you're going to Winnipeg. Your thoughts on that? Well, you know, we'll just relish this one for a little bit, and uh, if we go to Winnipeg, then we know a lot about them. We played them late in the year. We know they're tough in Winnipeg, so uh, we'll just try to lick our wounds. We got a couple guys injured, and we'll go up there and do the best we can. Probably haven't heard this, but the defending Grey Cup champion Eskimos are out. They lost in a field goal to the BC Lions, so the Grey Cup championship is there for somebody. Well, it really is, you know, and we don't have to worry about the West very much. What our concern is now the Eastern Division, and we've got 60 minutes to play to get there. Don, thanks for your time. Congratulations. Thank you very much. 
So the amazing season of the Baltimore CFLers continues. They're on their way to the East Division semifinal and one game away from the Grey Cup 34-15 the final. Out of Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, the CFLers didn't have Mike Pringle for this East Division semifinal game, but they had more than enough to beat the Toronto Argonauts, and they got it from a lot of players. Robert Drummond filling in for Mike Pringle, one of them, 34-15 the final, and what a debut for this guy in the CFL. Until today, you had not rushed once in a CFL game, and I guess you more than made up for all that. Uh, true, I, I haven't rushed once in a CFL game, but I mean, I played, you know, organized football at the NFL, so running is nothing new to me, you know, it's just, it just took some getting used to it once again, and once I got going, you know, the rest is history. And uh, so much for the running. They said you're a very talented receiver, um, and you certainly earned your money that way today. Well, you I mean, I always considered myself a versatile back growing up, you know. I mean, my idol was Marcus Allen, you know, and that's always try to, like, I always try to epitomize myself that, you know, just be as good a receiver as I am a runner, and that's what I did. Were you confident that you were going to get the start today? Because uh, there was some suggestion this afternoon that Mike Pringle might somehow appear in this game. I mean, I wasn't worried about the start or anything. You know, I had one goal in mind, you know, after last week lost to Sacramento, and that's what, that was prepare for Toronto and win this game. We did that. And what about next week? Mike Pringle declared during the game he's going to play. That could leave you out in the cold. Hey, of course, everybody's going to be cold in Winnipeg, but... Hey, Mike Pringle got us here, you know, and like, as they say, you know, you go what got you here, and he's a strong runner. I give him a lot of credit. You know, I can take, I can take a backseat to Mike Pringle if they can get us to the Grey Cup. So I don't mind. Were you in on something special today to have a first-year CFL team go all the way to the East Division Final? Oh, that means a lot, you know. It's just it's something right now that, you know, I just can't put into words right now, but once I get a chance to sit down and think back on it, it's going to be big. Robert, thanks for your time. Congratulations. Enjoy this victory, even if you don't get to play next week. All right, thank you. But we will get a chance to play next week. Well, so, you may not personally, oh, okay, but the Baltimore okay. CFLers yeah. will for sure. All right, definitely. Thank all you. Right. Thanks again. Don, up to you. I don't know whether it would have made much difference in the ball game, but, James, I still think those two turnovers where Toronto was unable to capitalize might have made the difference in the ball game. You think otherwise. You think it was the pass to Dave Irwin that was called back. The pass to Dave Irwin, the non-call when they called the interference when Carl Anthony ran up Dave Irwin's back. I think at that point it took all the wind and the momentum away from the Toronto Argonauts when they had an opportunity to get back in this game, and we'll see it right here perfect. How can you call a receiver for interference when he doesn't do anything to obstruct the flight of the defender? Well, there were two flags in the play. One official call defensive interference on Carl Anthony the other offensive interference on Dave Irwin and that nullified a Toronto touchdown and uh, pretty much as James said took the wind out of the sails of the Toronto Argonauts as they go down to defeat to the Baltimore CFLers in the semifinal game at Memorial Stadium Scott how far can the Baltimore CFLers go in their first year all the way to the East Division final as it turns out they await the winner of tomorrow's semifinal in Winnipeg now between the Bombers and Rough Riders and the final score in Edmonton today, the Grey Cup champion Eskimos are out losing 24-23 to the BC Lions in their West Division semifinal. And here, the final score, 34-15. The CFLers are now within one game of a Grey Cup appearance. They love the Canadian game even more in Baltimore now. So long.